discernment and clarity, a discussion about discernment and clarity. And um, we have, of course, our local Smurf, uh, Jay, here. Um, we have uh, me, I'm Tom Warrior, a.k.a. Dave Kelso, as I click on this thing. There's a little bit of delay time, so I don't know if voice and video is synchronized. What do I know? Um, my first time hosting a Hangout, actually. And um, we also have Mike Gardner. I'm doing my best to click the controls on the video screens. Bear with me. First time I'm sailing this particular Google Hangout ship. Katerina Edwards. And I'm clicking over into her video thingy. Um, again, I don't know if it's recording better than it's displaying back to me. I'm getting a little bit of delay, but hopefully the, the video and the sound are lining up while it's uh, recording. Then clicking back to the um, the, the, the Smurf again. <laughs> Jay Larson there. And then we got um, Brian, and um, he's running the nonprofit organization called Safety Net Industries. And then, of course, we have Ashley. And um, Ashley, Brian, and Katerina are all a part of the Empower Network. So, um, discernments and clarity. The main focus here, because everybody is, you know, we've been trained to see things in terms of good and evil. So it's like we judge the tools, and the tools, you know, make us their bitch. It's like, oh, those evil corporations. No, corporations are just a mechanism, a construct. And, you know, we need to take responsibility and stop expecting our politicians to be our babysitters and we need to be willing to not only come up with the solutions but implement them ourselves uh, before these psychopaths destroy the earth and kill us all. So on that note, who wants to open this up? I'll start. So basically what I've got going on here, what we've got going on here, is a bunch of collection of ideas. This is basically everybody's ideas all rolled into one. So this isn't anybody one any one person's idea. This is our idea. And this is our place. What we're gonna do is we've got a bunch of homeless people out on the streets right now. And they're all looking for a way out. And we've got a bunch of people sitting around with all of these college degrees and they're living with their parents working minimum wage jobs and not ever getting anywhere they wanted to get. Loaded with debt, so it seems like they'll never climb their way out. Our government right now has spent itself to the point where they can't really maintain what they're doing. And um, so what I'm figuring out is that, well, panhandling has become illegal. And so is loitering. But I can put signs in the hands of these homeless people to collect money for the nonprofit organization. So now they're not doing anything wrong and they're working so they're not loitering. So that ordinance is negated as well. And then pretty much puts a circle of protection around these people because now they don't have to tell the police who they are because they're not doing anything wrong. And this this will give them the option to prove that they're going to be a force for good rather than falling into criminal activity on the streets or being locked in a jail where they just become worse criminals. And so, while they're doing that, and they're out on these streets, they can be explaining to people exactly how they got that way in the first place. And so, they can get, people can get the information straight from the horse's mouth, rather than from these politicians who only visit a soup kitchen every now and again for a photo op. And these people out on the streets can be collecting signatures on petitions to get rid of the corrupt officials, and to get rid of horrible legislation and we can put cameras in their hands so they can take pictures of all of the horrible things that are happening out there so we'll have evidence of it and so we can help out the police in doing their job because they can't be everywhere at all at once and um, we're gonna put together safety net industries which is a place where it's like a homeless shelter but it's more of a college and instead of it being set up like a homeless shelter, it's more like a dorm room where everybody has their own apartment 
and we're going to teach people how to grow gardens with organics and permaculture. We're going to teach people how to grow, make clothes and, and basic necessities. And we're going to teach people how to turn treasure, trash, into treasure by taking all the stuff that's laying around that we can recycle and turn into great things. There's already people that have come up with all kinds of ideas of how to do that. And we just need to network those people with the people that want to make a change in the world. And we can bring in all those people with all these college degrees that are sitting around not using them. And we can help have them help us put this whole place together. They can start setting up all these shops and using their degrees to, to put us all straight. Now we've got all these employees of oppressive businesses like Walmart that are holding everybody down and making everybody feel worthless. And a lot of times these employees have really great ideas, but as soon as they try to implement them, they get chased out. A lot of the times the company tells them that, and tells them that they quit, so they can't collect unemployment. That's not going to be a problem anymore, because they can just come to us. And we can take care of all of the needs that they would ever want. <coughs> and since it'll be like a college, we'll get it accredited, and they can volunteer for the place. And since they'll have everything that they want right there at their disposal, and they're volunteering for a nonprofit organization, they don't have to pay their taxes anymore. And so, basically, we're going to bring in all these people. But before they leave these companies, we're going to use a team of reporters, and we're going to show them how to document everything that's going on in these places. And then we're going to report the news in our own TV and radio stations. And then we're going to help these people after they just put all of our shops together correctly. We're going to help them apply for funding to start their own employee-owned businesses. So that they can learn how to implement all of the things that they've learned and the degrees that they've gotten in safety net industries. And they can learn how to put them to work in a social manner. And since it's employee-owned, then everybody shares in the profits. And so it gives everybody a, a reason to try to make it work better. So, basically then, from there, they'll become the competition for all these businesses out there that are messing up. So we can support all the good things in the world, while also reporting on all the bad things in the world. And then from there, they'll have their own wings, and they'll be able to fly on their own. And then they'll start being able to really put their dreams into work, creating all kinds of great things on alternative sources of energy and, and better technology. And we can start working together to build things the right way instead of the way that everything's made to break. And um, then we can go even further than that. And like Jay and Dave had actually suggested, well, why don't we go ahead and start returning all the fruits and vegetables to nature and make sure that there's water sources everywhere and as soon as all of this starts flourishing on its own again that means that even the people that don't want to be a part of this and just want to have fun out in nature will have every way to do so without needing to worry about anything they won't need anything they can just walk from one side of the country all over the place <coughs> on their own and have everything that they need well here's a question what about, um, for example, people such as myself who are a little uh, addicted to the uh, nicotine here, or even people that are addicted to harder drugs and stuff, what about people who are out on the streets because they ended up with drug habits that, that broke them down? Um, uh, what, what would your um, nonprofit organization do? as far as um, helping those people. And on top of that, because this is about discernment and clarity in this session, plenty of people are going to say, oh, well, what if this is a scam? And there's 10,000 other organizations out there. And, and, and what's the difference between yours and theirs? And how do we know this is for real? And, and, and I mean, you, you already know all the typical questions. Yeah. So uh, how, would you, how would you answer that? Well, because people are going to say, what about the drug addicts that are that were into crime, or the the cigarette smokers, or the you know people addicted to caffeine? You know, well, where these addictions get in the way. We'll actually have our own drug re rehab facility, and we won't drug test anybody. We'll just give them the help that they need. 
And the more people will be able to bring in that way because they're no longer afraid to come in and get the help that they need, then we'll have more people figuring out better ways to treat them and more people coming in to get treated. And since this place will be full of mu music and movies and artwork and everything, <coughs> we'll have all kinds of stuff to just distract them from even worrying about it. Because most of the times, people who, that turn to that stuff turn to it because they're just bored and they got nothing better to do. They got nothing to occupy their time. And really, when it comes down to it, all those safety nets out there are broken. And they were made broken in the first place to keep everybody in a point of slavery. None of them are actually doing anything to help anybody. Think about all the money that we've sent overseas to try to help all these starving people. With all the money that we've sent over there so far, you'd think they'd be fed by now, right? We're too busy bombing them. <laughs> well, the thing of it is, is they have to be starving in order for these companies to be able to keep pulling money in. Mm -hmm. And religions don't really want to teach people to fish. They just want to give a man a fish to get, bring him back into the, their religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the government doesn't really want to be taking care of all these problems because, well, that was never their job in the first place. I mean, we well, keep pawning all of our issues on onto them and giving them all of the power that they need. We're the ones who keep creating their presence. And we're the ones who keep basically kicking them out of the party and yelling and screaming at them and trying to demand that they do all these things for us that we should be doing for ourselves. I'd like to know what Katarina Edwards thinks about all this. Uh, we can't hear her. What's going on? I don't know. Katerina, we are not hearing you at all. Oh, I guess somebody muted me. Sorry. <laughs> was it, it wasn't me. <laughs> so, I was saying, it's interesting that you're talking about doing this kind of thing, because I actually have a friend of mine. She goes to the University of Oregon. Um, they're thinking about building, like, a Walmart uh, pretty close by where I live. And that would really hurt the local economy, like the Montauk, like yeah, the grocery stores and stuff like that. So she's actually thinking about spending the summer um, going to some of the leaders around the city and talking with them about what we could possibly do to develop that land to be something that's actually going to contribute more to the local economy than and, you know, just building a freaking Walmart, you know? Well, then let's build safety net industries. <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say, Brian? I was like, so then let's build safety net industries. See, that's exactly what she's thinking about. I mean, she's gonna very interested in the permaculture stuff. She's very interested in all of the... I'm sorry, I'm hearing myself feedback. Yeah, yeah. that's that's not from me. I plugged in my headphones, so... um, who's not Who here isn't using headphones? Oh, I'm not. I'm outside though. Yeah, it's we just probably use headphones. <laughs> My point though is that the um, I mean, there's definitely people that are wanting to do things like this. I think it's just a matter of funding and implementation and uh, gathering all of the people together who are really interested in doing this kind of thing. Well, it's, it's funny because I just went to the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors meeting the other day, and I went there with. Respect Arizona and Concerned Citizens for uh, Better Arizona and Unafraid Americans. And we came up there with the top ten reasons for why to recall Joe Arpaio. Because that guy needs to be gone. Yeah, FYI for the people listening, um, Brian and Jay are both in Arizona. They actually just met in person yesterday. And uh, Jay gave them a bunch of non-GMO seeds. Maybe Jay might want to share some information as to where the people out there can pick up non-GMO seeds if they're interested in planting something that's not tainted. I actually wanted to say something because they have me on a lot of medications that are like narcotics, and I think that a lot of people have drug problems in general when they get put on a medication like a narcotic. And then when they get taken off of it, they go to harder drugs because they get addicted. And that's just one of the things in this world that, like, my brother has drug problems because he had that happen to him. And I don't really know how to deal with it. Like, 
he's got addiction problems and the whole nonprofit idea is great. But how do you get people that are addicted to drugs to go get help? Well, I know me personally, I was addicted to them for a long time. And I had to come to my own realization. And there's nobody that's going to be able to do something for me that I'm not going to do for myself. Yeah. But basically, we're going to make this place like a huge party. And to tell you the truth, in indigenous tribes and hunter-gatherer societies, people, they don't... They don't demonize drugs. They celebrate them. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of things out there that are fun about life, you know. Yeah. And we can actually deal with them in a controlled situation mm -hmm. where we can actually use them for positive benefits. Yeah. Well, that goes back to my original question to Jay. I, I was seeing, as I said, that he gave you some non-GMO seeds. I'm curious if Jay could tell us, uh, as far as anybody else out there looking to get non-GMO seeds, um, how they might go about uh, searching those out, hunting those down, and acquiring those. Okay. Uh, basically, we're, we're not, oh, there we are. Okay, uh, basically I got, uh, um, just online, I went to a uh, place like InfoWars and places like that, uh, I, um, sell uh, non-GMO uh, seeds, what they call uh, um, what do they call them? Heirloom seeds. Heirloom seeds. Uh, because the, 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 yeah, they haven't they haven't been crossbred in any way. They're so they don't so that they the vitality of the seeds are are always there and always work. They um uh, they haven't been crossbred out to get certain properties. Um. By the seed cup, seed cup like the seed companies do, so you get reliant on their seeds because they have to cross pollinate their their plants to make their seeds even viable. Now, Jay, here's a question, um, because you know a lot about this stuff. What would you suggest are some good plants to grow that'll pretty much grow in any environment, whether you're in northern, whether you're in the extreme tropical or wherever. I know that onions and raspberries are, are two two good ones, like chive onions and raspberries, and they'll keep coming back, and th those can grow in virtually desert areas. They can grow in tropical areas. They can grow in Chicago. They can grow in Canada. Um, what other plants would you suggest instead of trying to trying to break it down into regions for people watching this from different regions? Uh, let's list off some things that'll pretty much grow just about anywhere. Most plants will. Um, a, a lot of you have to compensate in different ways. Like here in Arizona, you may have to create artificial shade uh, or or uh, spray the plants. Uh, fine mist of water to keep the temperature from affecting them is bad. Drip methods of irrigation um, for the plants we use down here. They use two types of irrigation type. Um, one is a monthly feed using a, a um, where they irrigate and they flood the field with water. The second type is running lines through it where there's a slow drip drip feed all the time, which seems to work better for the plants. They're more tolerant of a drip feed than they are mm. of, to be flooded. What about misting? Because I know for misting, you should just be able to get like a regular like hose and then take a, a needle or something like that and punch holes in it if you want to do it kind of the, um, the uh, patch job sort of way and, and just have okay. things just kind of misting out. Okay. Uh, this you can order online these uh, misters uh, uh, because they sell, they they sell a lot of them for people to cool off out when they're outdoors on their porch. They have these misters, and outside in restaurants they have these misters to cool the air so the customers can eat. About how outside. much are they? What what are we looking at if you're to buy something like that? What kind of price tag are we talking about? Well, well basically all they are is plastic. Plastic tubing with little uh, um, little misters on them. Um, misters are probably about twenty five cents a piece, and you probably need uh, 
on a, on a length of about 10 feet, you probably need five or six of them. So you're talking about the cost of the plastic tubing, the, the little misters that you install on there, and uh, then basically a connect, connection to a water faucet outside to turn, um, to turn it on to create the mist. Yeah, I was actually thinking of uh, implementing some some misters here in my garden because um, I got a backyard pond as well, and that's in symbiosis with uh, with, with the garden. And um, you know, if if people want to want to make ponds and stuff, I mean, you, I live in Chicago. You don't have to be out in rural nowhere to do it. But um, if people want to make ponds and stuff, you know, not only can you do your own hydroponics and whatever else, but um, you know, you, you could like um. For example, bluegill are a good eating fish, and those things will breed in just about anything. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, you get a bluegill or carp, things like that, things that aren't game fish, so you're not running into any problems with the authorities, but they're they're edible. So, um, you know, growing your own food or raising fish, anything like that, oh. that's going to take down your, your grocery bill and put more money in your pocket that you can then spend on things that are going to make you even more self-sufficient. Oh instead of feeding the system. Now here's an idea about trying to water here. Now, now with uh, misting, uh, it, it, by watering with mist, your plant can absorb the water and nutrients that you put in the water right from the leaves and the red. <coughs> of the plant, not just the roots. Yeah. So you can actually increase the plant production because you're getting the water directly to the leaves where it's free. Yeah. What were you trying to say, Brian? Well, there's an idea that I had about watering plants that I ran across a little while that was really great. You know leach pipe that they use for septic tanks? Septic <coughs> it's, it's about like four inch pipe with holes drilled in the sides of it so that it leaches out into a field. They bury these pipes in the ground. Well, usually they're used for septic to spread the waste out so that it can decompose in the ground, but you can actually run this pipe underground and put together like a, a grid or, you know, lines, and then just hook that up to a sprinkler, uh, um, a sprinkler system, and then you can fill those pipes up with water underground, and it'll just keep the water in the ground. Yeah. You could use that in combination with what I was telling you about the other day because um, if you, let's say, you can't water that frequently or you live in like an area where, where the temperatures are extremely hot and there's high risk of water evaporation, <clears throat> you dig about two feet down or more, maybe two, two and a half feet, and you get kitty litter and you put a, a layer of, uh, of kitty litter down there and then put your dirt back over it. Because I figure um, if kitty litter is going to hold cat pee, it's going to hold water. And that creates a, a water reservoir. I know um, I, I got three cats and, and I take the, uh, shall we say, the, the, the kitty shitty mixture. And um, I take that and I, I dig like a two, three foot hole. And I put that in the ground and, you know, like three years later I can dig that back up and it's completely decomposed dirt. But for people who might be a little grossed out about the idea of, oh my God, I don't want cat crap in there. Okay, it's just fertilizer, but fine. We'll, we'll go with your phobias here. If you don't, if you want to cater to your phobia, then just, you know, get just a big old bag of a, a kitty litter. And uh, when you di dig your two foot hole, maybe have like a... Uh, a three to four inch, you know, layer of uh, kitty litter at the bottom of that, and then put the dirt back over on top of it, and then anything that you plant over that area is going to have access to that water reservoir, because that kitty litter is going to store the water, and after a few years, it's going to break down into dirt. So, in maybe about between three and five years, you will have to repeat that process again. You could even put the kitty litter in the trenches where you lay the the uh, leach field pipe. That's true. That would be awesome. Yeah, because that'll hold it. Because you got to have the dirt over it to avoid the evaporation. But if you've got your kitty litter layer, then you've got your dirt over it. Um, that still holds moisture, and the roots are going to grow down to tap it. What I'm doing here with these uh, gardens in the yard here is uh, I've got soaker hose. 
And um, they make a drip line soaker hose that's little quarter inch tubing. And you can, um, I, I made nets out of them, like actual nets. And then I laid mm -hmm. that across the ground. And so it, it slowly drips all the water and it really, you know, penetrates and spreads everything out real well. How, how far do you have it buried? Oh, no, they're laying on the top of the gardens, of the raised bed oh, garden. Okay. Yeah, they're little nets that I've put together, like a grid. Yeah. yeah. And then so when I put the grid together of that soaker tube, I lay it over the top, and it actually creates a grid for planting. So you can know where you need to mm. separate everything out and everything like that. Yeah, I've got a, I've got an indoor pond as well, and um, I'm experimenting with hydroponics with that because I'm working on creating fully recyc recyclable filtration systems so that I don't have to keep dumping the, the muck out of the, the filter and wasting that by putting that into the garbage can. Um, I can just have the, um, the biofilter um, process that automatically, and the plants grow out. Right now we just have like regular house plants testing with it, but I want to see what kind of perennial food plants I might be able to to get cooperative with that. Uh, maybe some of those little mini orange trees or something. Whatever I could figure out how to get to be you know cooperative um, with hey, that. Hey. So that's an experimentation. Check out garden pools. They've done this here in the valley already. Really? Yeah, they take a pool. And then they empty it out to where just the, the deep end has water in it, and that's uh -huh. your pond. And so then they put a chicken coop above that, and they grow duckweed <coughs> up from, um, in, from the water, and uh -huh. they put fish in the pond. And so the chickens eat the duckweed, and then they shit down into the pond, and then that gets pumped up through the hydroponic beds that are up onto the shallow end of the pool. And they cover the whole thing with a greenhouse with PVC pipe and everything. And um, and they make it to where they can roll up the, the cover on it, you know, clear plastic cover. Yeah. Uh, what not, a shade cloth. Um, they've got a swamp cooler hooked up onto it so that it can keep it cool and maintain the temperature. And they run that swamp cooler off of solar panels. Explain, explain to us uh, snowbirds what a swamp cooler is. It's an evaporative cooler. Um, basically, when water evaporates, it becomes cold. And so what a swamp cooler does is it has pads, and it's just a fan that blows, and, the, and it sucks the air through the wet pads. It's got a recirculation system that constantly keeps those pads wet so that as the water is being blown across the pads, the water evaporates, and it makes the air both moist and cold at the same time. Now I've got a really good concept for trying to mix an air conditioner and a swamp cooler together into one unit. I'm not sure if it'll totally work, but I think that it would because if you've got an air conditioner that'll take your humid air out of your house and dry it and all that water, because once it goes through an air conditioner, the, the cooling coil will actually condense all the water out of the air and go into the drip pan. Well, actually, I got one, I got one better because an air conditioner requires Freon. Yeah. But, but guess what doesn't? Uh, A dehumidifier. Also, you can also make air conditioners run off of uh, things other than Freon. I mean, they've even Such got ones as? that just use compressed air. Really? Yeah. Air, airplanes, actually, I do believe, use compressed air. You can look up, look up vortex tubes. They work on that concept a bit. How do you spell that? Vortex tubes. B o r t e x. Um, t u b e s. Is that like yeah, dot like com those, or is there like a site you can get them at or? No, the, like Hilch vortex. vortex tubes. No, they're called Hilch vortex tubes. You can create on one end as you put pressured eyes air through it. One end will get extremely cold, and the other end will get extremely hot. Well, in the me in the meantime, you might want to check out using um, dehumidifiers. Well, yeah, but here, here, here's the whole concept, though. The some whole concept plant, some is some plants will pull the moisture right out of the air. So will a dehumidifier. Yeah, That's but listen, but listen to this. What the air conditioner does is it makes the air cold, mm -hmm. and then it condenses the water out of the air and that drain pan can run into the pan for the swamp cooler and then the swamp cooler can then take 
that cool dry air and then make it even colder and make it humid again. Yeah. And then blow it back into your house. And see, at that point, now you don't have dry air that will just dissipate the temperature. You've got humid air that will contain the temperature for a long time. Okay, but if you just wanted to extract uh, moisture out of the air, uh, dehumidifier no. will do that. I want to cool it and extract the moisture. Okay. And then cool it further by adding the moisture back. So the two systems working together in unison will actually make it more efficient because it won't need to run as long in order to keep everything cold. You know how you should be able to even cool it without an air conditioner, though? If you have a system that goes deep deep enough underground, like oh, let's, yeah. say, let's say 8 to 10 feet, um, even on the hottest summer, it, uh, ten, 10 feet underground is going to be like within the 50 degree range. Yeah, a lot of people, like, I mean, that's pretty weird to me that more people don't have basements out here in the desert. You know, and I think they did that for a reason because these houses out here dissipate temperature really easily and an air conditioner is running all the time to keep it cold. Well, that makes a lot of money for the uh, energy companies. Yeah, well, the other thing is is that you've got a lot more solid ground out there, so it's basically a bitch to create a basement. But you're right. It's like why, why do they want, want to spend money on, on the bitch of creating a basement when they could uh, steal money from you on the electricity? Uh-huh. Yeah, I had land out in El Paso for a while, and I was going to totally build like a whole underground house where the whole, mm -hmm. where just the top of it was up at the ground, yeah. so you could walk in. But the rest of it was all going to be underground or built into a hillside. Yeah, that's called an Earth ship. You yeah, could do a Facebook or a Google or a YouTube. Search one of my for friends, Earthship. one of my friends' families in New Mexico is involved in building Earth ships. It's pretty cool the stuff they yeah. do. They can you build know, these things out of just trash. Yeah, you know what? Know what we really need to do, though. You know, everybody's um, talking about getting off the grid. I got a better one for you. Let's stay, revamp the grid. Stay on the grid and become it. Yeah. You realize that a combination of wind and solar power, if you hook that up for your house, um, not only can you generate electricity for your house, but in most states, the surplus that you put back out to the grid. The electric company has to pay you. Yep. That's actually being done a lot here. And the electric companies were actually subsidizing the cost of the solar powers. And right now, the government's come up with a plan, and they're, they're actually cutting people's power bills <clears throat> to go through the evaluation and see about getting solar panels put on your house. There's even companies that will lease you the solar panels, and so they put their solar panels on your roof, and then make it to where you don't have to pay so much for electricity. It yeah. made it easier for people. I haven't had time to screw with this yet, but there's something called Power for Patriots. I actually bought the system. It's got um, you know instruction manuals and DVDs and everything. And they will tell you step by step how to make your own solar panels, how to make wind turbines and everything else. And oh, yeah. One of the big things that really blew my mind is when they show you how to make a wind turbine out of nothing but a couple of pieces of PVC pipe because yep. if you buy a wind turbine $1000 yeah if you i mean if you buy a wind turbine well it's not quite that much for a small one but it's still hundreds of dollars but if you build one yourself how much does a couple of pieces of freaking PVC cost i mean you're you're going to spend 20 bucks at most and only at a place that's really ripping you off on it and you can even find it one of them small generators where the engine doesn't run anymore and just take the generator part off and hook it up to those fan blades and put a tail on it and you're good. Yeah, and then that, that cranks out uh, DC energy and then you just take that and run it through an inverter. You Not to mention, I found an inverter, it's like something like um, 400 bucks, but guess what it does? It's capabilities, it can invert enough power to run a freaking skyscraper. I mean, I shit you not. And this damn thing, it's computer controlled. It's got a web interface you can use to log in, into the thing. Yeah, and um, this thing will produce something like 99 kilowatts of electricity. And plus, it automatically has, has its own regulator in it already as far as when to pull off the grid if need be and what the surplus is to push back into the grid. So it has an automatic regulation in it. 
and um, it'll hook into a computer via like USB port, and it's got like a web interface, and it's well, some real, it's some really slick shit. The way it works is they're actually recycling the energy that you're using, because most of the energy that you pay for is actually going right back to the electric company. And so what they're doing is they're taking it and they're recycling it before it goes back to the electric company and making more use out of it. Yeah, but not to mention, I mean, this thing is designed so that it hooks into solar, wind, whatever you're doing. Oh, yeah. And inverts that energy. And what I, what I saw that, that was really stupid, um, this one video came with it that showed a full-blown solar install, like from... From start to finish, the installer took you through it. And the way the, the person, the resident who owned the house, wanted it to hook up is that the solar panels were going directly into the, into the inverter so that when there wasn't enough sunlight, it would pick back up off the main grid. And I'm thinking to myself, what happened to a battery array? Yeah. Why, why aren't they charging batteries? so that they don't have to pull off the grid. And they could even use things like forklift batteries that are really huge and can store a whole bunch of power. Well, you can do, you can just use those um those one car batteries um the, the one the, 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 yeah, yeah, the deep cycle batteries you that don't, even better don't spew out all the fumes. What's, What's up? Is a uh, golf cart batteries. Really? Yeah, they're 6 volts, so you need two of them in order to make 12 volts. But you can hook them up in series and parallel, so where you've got 12 volts at however many amps you want. And golf cart batteries has a way of storing power, and they're made to be able to to go on huge drains. I mean, they're made to push a golf cart around. How much are they, though? Oh, they're usually about 80 bucks a piece. Really? That's it? Yeah. Are they deep cycle? Yep. They're made to be nice. charged, and if you look, uh, I think. Uh, Continental makes them. Um, I used to go to golf cart places and I'd pick up their old ones that were good used ones, and we'd still make a bunch of use out of them. And they'll sell them real cheap for like five, ten bucks. I used to go down there and just give them Renaissance Festival tickets, and they'd mm -hmm. hand me a bunch of them because yeah. they replace them out of people's golf carts all the time, and we could still use them for a long time after that. Well, what uh, as an average, what I've learned is that if you've got about a, a a 16 to 18 volt uh, battery system hooked up to um, one solar panel. When you invert that, um, depending on how you're doing it, it's like the equivalent of between um, two and f two and four standard outlets. So I kind of use that as a um, as a unit of of measurement. So if people are trying to figure out how many solar panels they need, and you know, one wind turbine is equivalent to that too. One of the smaller turbines. So if people are trying to figure out how much energy they want to put in versus how many outlets they have in the house and, and whatever, you figure one solar panel or, or one turbine with you know a 16 to, uh, to, to 18 volt um, battery array, that'll do between two and four outlets. So you know you multiply by that. And yes, you run it all together in series like you were saying. Yeah. So awesome ideas. Is Katerina, uh, is Katerina and Mike still here? It looks like... Oh, yeah, oh. I am. Katerina, do you have anything to say about this stuff? I'm actually kind of multitasking with some other stuff. I mean, I'm still here, I'm still listening, but I'm not really like paying attention to the conversation. No offense. Well, we're just talking about all, all alternative energy and hooking that up in, in, into our homes that instead of getting off the grid, we're becoming the grid so that now the electric company has to pay us. So... Oh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a cool idea, yeah. You know me, I'm still, I still now, Dave, want, what do you... I kind of want to get off the grid, you know. Like, I still kind of want to, you know, just have my tiny house and <laughs> just live that life and do that. That reminds me, I, 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 I still have to give you a pirated copy of the, um, the videos and PDF files that I bought from Power for Patreons. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple buildings in Portland that have alternative energy. Like you can see the. We can barely hear you. My microphone sucks. Yeah, you were garbling a bit. <laughs> um, our in Portland, there's a whole bunch 
of alternative energy buildings when you go downtown Portland. You can see the wind things on top of the buildings where the, you could actually tell that they're using the energy that you're talking about, like the saved energy. Yeah. Wind. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> like I feel like kind of dumb not knowing what they're called. Well, it's okay. I don't know what they're. I don't know what they're called either. <laughs> but I'm like I like I see them. I'm like those are so awesome. We definitely need those in our house. You know what I just noticed? We have the entire United States represented right here because Katerina and Ashley are both in the Portland area, so you've got Pacific. You've got um, Brian and Jay in um, the mountain area in Arizona. So you've got me in Chicago, so I'm Midwest, and then Mike is East Coast. So we've got the entire United States um, represented on this chat line. And also, as far as what we were talking about before, um, apparently Jay is right about the configuration of, of six. So what happened to David? I think Ashley can answer that better than anybody. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I asked if he wanted to join. He said he's with family. He texted me and said he wants to join. and. He just keeps sending me his easy money code, which I don't understand why he keeps sending that to me because I have my own. Well, maybe um, he's just multitasking too much and he's busy with family after all. It yeah. is mo it is Mother's Day and somebody in his family has got to be a mother up in there somewhere, so he's probably just busy. We all have mothers. <laughs> Let me go get my headset so that you can hear me. Alrighty. Is Mike still here? Uh, he's in a low mode right now. He's talking to me on Facebook, and he's kind of just having a hard time. So okay. we're not gonna. Um, no, I think he's here, but he said he doesn't have much to say. So okay, well that's fine. Participation is, um, you oh, know, vo voluntary. It's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. Brian, I'm sending you some stuff, by the way. If he can hear me. Brian, are you still there? I can hear you. We're, we're not getting Brian's audio. There we go. There we go. All right. Yep, I'm here. Okay, okay cool. cool. So anyway, on, on these on the subject of um, discernment and clarity in relation to you know all this other stuff, you know, you've got so many conspiracy facts, conspiracy theories. You've got quantum physics, metaphysics, geopolitics. Everyone's on information overload, and everyone's asking, well, who do we believe? Who do we trust? Everybody's presenting solutions. But like you said, Brian, about Occupy Wall Street, sometimes people get together and then and then split. Like, you know, all these good ideas come together, but then there's no coordination. And um, I really think that when it comes to discernment, people just need to research into things and, and make up their own minds about it. And um, be willing to be a part of the solution. That's, you know, that's really the biggest thing because um, one thing that our, our psychological, or not psychological, psychopathic politicians and world reader, leaders are sick of, and I can't really blame them on this note, is that, you know, we're treating them like babysitters. We want them to come up with the solutions for us. Uh, we want them to implement those solutions, and we're not willing to do our part. We're sitting there crying like a bunch of kindergartners. And so can you really blame them that they want to eliminate, um, you know, 6.5 billion people and bring it down to 500 million toddlers instead of, you know, 7 billion whiny bitches? Um, on that note, I can't blame them. As but, far as they're concerned, we're all a bunch of ants crawling all over them. 
Yeah, yeah but, but the, what, what happens not, when a bunch of ants start crawling all over you? Yeah, you get a little freaked out. You want to brush them all off real fast. Yeah, but the thing is also is that if they want us to to wake up and um, you know, be more independent. Just like parents dealing with children, because that's the situation that they're in, they're parents, but they're the, you know, abusive wife-beating daddy government and, and corporate mommy, you know, cocaine addict or whatever. Um, you know, they got to get their own shit straight, too, and they've got to set the example by um, stop putting the goddamn fluorine in our fucking water and dumbing people down and GMOs and the FDA and all that. How do they expect people to wake up who are in an intoxication fog? You know, if you get Obama or any of these other assholes drunk, I bet you they could barely run their legs, much less anything else, you know what I'm saying? So, if they're, if they're intoxicating us, then... How are they supposed to expect us to stop being dependent on them if being dependent on them is what, you know, they're forcing us into doing? So I think it's very important that people like us look at the situation holistically and relate to everybody and tell everybody to knock off their shit. To tell the sheeple, hey, you're being fucked, but don't go in the self-victimization, knock off your shit. And to tell the politicians, you know what, I can understand your point, but you guys are a bunch of arrogant power tripping bitches. Knock off your shit. Yeah, everybody's got to knock off the shit. We're blaming the politicians. The politicians are blaming us. And guess what that does? That makes everybody control freaks, addicted to our stress hormones. Everyone's in fight or flight. Everyone thinks that in order to control their own lives, they have to control the external, and that's just a bunch of bullshit. The Illuminati have fallen under their own spell. In their arrogance, they thought that they could create and control the chaos while remaining on the outside of it, but in reality, they become a direct part of that chaos that they're looking, looking to control. So they've become a part of the problem, and they've lost control, and they know it. So everybody needs to, like, you know, calm the fuck down. We all need to realize our own arrogance and our own hypocrisy and look at it without being ashamed of it and just be like, you know, just look at it objectively. All right, you know, like the song says, we didn't start the fire, but it is up to us to put out the fire. And if we're screaming and, and yelling and we're afraid of fire and going, oh, that evil fire, we're not putting out the fire. We all got to calm the fuck down and work with each other. You know, I don't care that someone was a KKK, someone was a Black Panther, this person hates that person, this faction's against that faction. We got to knock it the fuck off and come together, put all that trivial bullshit aside. I don't care if you like me, hate me, if you're gay, straight, bi, Jewish, Christian, atheist, I don't give a fuck. We're all just different expressions of the exact same type of hypocrite, and we gotta just chill. We gotta realize that we're all full of shit, and we gotta calm the hell down, get a hold of ourselves, and be willing to work together. And be willing to say, all right, well, I hate you, and I think you're a bitch, but that's fine. I respect your right and my right, and be, regardless of our opinions of each other, we're still in this situation together. So we still got to, to do something about it instead of acting like a, a room full of screaming little kids crying for mommy. So I've got an know. actual, I've got an actual uh, piece of evidence to back up what you just said. I just had a conversation before we started this, and that was kind of what took me so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to talk to one of my activist friends that is actually trying to get some stuff done, but mm -hmm. he's going about it all the wrong way. He's like. Trying to work with, um, you know, these groups that are trying to run off on their own and go and yell and scream for Bradley Manning's release, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to explain to him that, look, what's going on here is they're holding Bradley Manning as an incentive right now for us to put things together. Well, basically, they've created all of this pain and everything in the world to try to poke us with a stick to wake us up. We're like basically a hive of bees that they've created and then they kept poking the hive of bees until the bees would swarm and take back the whole society. 
Yeah, because you know what? Everybody always wants people to sign petitions. The worst thing you can do is petition your government or demand anything of government. Because when you're making a demand of government, what you're telling them is, I'm not willing to do anything. I'm expecting you to do everything. And so the politicians are looking, looking at you like, okay, well, you're my bitch then. So you're not willing to give me any sort of feedback, any sort of opposition. You're not willing to do anything yourself. You're expecting me to do it all. So, all right, I'm going to bend you over and rape you with no guilt. Because, yeah, no, because, gonna, because you're, you're my bitch and you're saying, saying you're my bitch. So what so we got to do is we got to demand, demand and decree. And decree. We got to tell government, you know what, hey, check it out. This is what we're doing. So we either come on board or get the fuck out of our way. If you don't like it, get the fuck out of our way. But this is what we are doing because you get your power from us, and we're saying no more power for you. You're grounded. So either, either line up with us or get out of our way because God help you if you get in our way. Right. Well, we're, that's the, we're, we the ones, we're the ones that are yelling and kicking and screaming and demanding that they do all this stuff for us. We're the ones who kicked them out and made them the government in the first place. Exactly. They want to come over and join the party, but there's no way that they're going to come over here and join a party if we're going to keep acting like this. If we're going to keep pointing fingers and being at each other's throats, you can't blame them for not wanting to join this party yet. <laughs> I mean, if we're the ones keeping them out, then maybe we're the ones that need to change and let them in. But we need to turn around and start the change on our own so that we can allow them back in. Because we are the ones keeping them out. And they didn't lift a finger to cause any of these problems in the world. All they did is talk, about, uh, all they did is talk a lot of words and we decided to, to believe it. Yeah, and we went along and we're the ones carrying out all these actions that we are blaming them for. Mm-hmm. They are, they are only responsible for their own actions. They are not responsible for the rest of our actions. So they are responsible for deceiving the public. They are responsible for signing the orders they sign. And they are responsible for letting the things happen that have happened. But we are responsible for our own independent actions. It, hypothetically, if, um, if you kill someone, that's not Obama's fault. You know, if it's not Obama's fault, even if Obama gave you the order, you could say, well, fuck you, I'm not taking your order. Can I ask a question really quick? Like, sure. What kind of headset should I get? Cause I need to, I'm going to go get a headset. Like, what's a good headset? Yeah, I need to get one, too. I just pretty much, um, I got this on a deal on um, Amazon.com, <laughs> so, I, I mean, this is like headset. something like 10 I don't care if it's like... Well, you know, you... It, you can do it two different ways. You can get a stereo headphones and plug in and get yourself a mic, microphone. Well, what I did is that um, my webcam has a microphone built in, and then I just have regular headphones. That makes sense. But there's a number of different ways you can do it. There's no right or wrong way. It's just whatever you feel works for you. And, you know, that makes a good point about the thinking of the people and what we were just talking about. People are always sitting there waiting for orders. You tell me what I need to do. You tell me what's the best way to do it. We need to take back our sovereignty and ask ourselves, what will work for us? What do I want to do? I mean, people don't ask themselves, what do I want to do? Because they're taught, what you want to do doesn't matter. Only what government wants you to do matters. Only what parents want you to do matters. Only what the mainstream wants you to do matters. Only what your friends want you to do matters. Only what everybody else wants you to do matters. And you can't please anyone. And people are striving to be themselves and be authentic. But the thing is, is the quickest way to piss everybody off is be yourself. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. Okay. I'm going to go with right. them. I'll be like 10 minutes. Okay, not a problem. I think I'm going to go grab some headphones real quick so I can plug this in. All right. Well, then I guess uh, Katarina or Jay, which one of you wants to uh, go on a rant? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really rant. I rave more than anything. <laughs> well, now we know what kind of music you listen to. <laughs> 
Well, actually, I, I look, I, all I can see the good in things. <laughs> things are, are flowing at a, at a good rate. There's plenty of good synchronization. And yeah. we're getting good <laughs> ideas into one, in, into one single point, and then uh, <laughs> we each can basically play with all these ideas that are pre presented with us. Well, I guess it's time to insert a corny joke. Um, why did the metaphysician cross the road? To realize that he was already on the other side. He is sort of multi-dimensional there. <laughs> exactly. I think Brian's back. Almost. Kind of. Hey, Brian. Hey. Yeah. Why did the metaphysician cross the road? Why is that? To remind himself that he was already on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to say about all this stuff, Katarina? Oh, wow, Rebecca Whoa. Jernigan just signed on. Maybe we should try getting Whoa. her on a Google Hangout one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, Katerina, I never told you about a synchronicity. Um, Journeys with Rebecca is going to be back on the air if it isn't already. Oh, cool. She decided to come back. So, so Dave, awesome. Dave I'm, I'm thinking, well, I've already got the 501c3 filed, or in the works of being filed. You're thinking? I thought I smelled wood burning. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I'm going on my on my way tomorrow to get the paperwork filed with the Corporation Commission. And as soon as all this stuff is finished up, then I can register with the Secretary of State's office, and this is on. I've already linked my PayPal account to my website, and I've gotten it verified. So now I'm working on trying to get funding through Cabbage.com, and they can start funding money to this whole thing. And um, this is about to happen, like, real quick, real, like, right now. Especially now that I'm into the Empower Network. Now <coughs> I can spend all this time <coughs> generating a whole bunch of cash flow. Um, and so all I need to really do once I get all this funding in is get all these signs out into the hands of homeless people and, um, and find the property and start building this. So if we put together a series um, on YouTube and Google Hangout, that's and, what we're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and, we do, and we document everything that, we, that we're doing, every step of the way. And we show people exactly how this is all coming together. Because I tried to get a hold of the Discovery Channel, and they didn't call me back. So I'm like, you know what? They're not, gonna, they're not going to care. No, that's a good thing. We need to do this all on our own. We don't need yeah. to call in the government for all this stuff. We just need to do it ourselves. You know what? On that, on that point... Um, I want to share the uh, little evil plot that uh, you and I were, were talking about yesterday in regards to Chicago. What most people don't realize about Chicago is Chicago literally is a forest. I mean, if you go into Google Maps on Chicago, we don't have a serious mold problem. That's trees, okay? So um, we have acres and acres and acres of forest. The neighborhoods are, are practically forests themselves. And on the forest preserve lands and the lands like where the railroad tracks run and the expressways run and everything, that's all public property. And there's no law against um, beautifying that property, you know, planting trees, flowers, whatever. There's no law against that at all. As a matter of fact, we're actually encouraged to do it. There's so many acres of land. And it's like I was saying... What is a vegetable or an herb other than a flower that we're able to eat? They actually look very pretty. So I was telling you, let's say, for example, back on the raspberry example, or dill weed, or onion, or any number of things. Let's say you were able to send me a ton of it in bulk, right? Well, then I plant that in one area, in a forest preserve, or along the railroad tracks, or whatever. You need to pl plant this stuff close together in a colony because winter is always going to kill off a part of it in Chicago. 
So you want to have an exponential growth effect. If you only plant a little bit in one area and winter kills that off, you're not going to have your exponential growth effect. So imagine if we start growing food on the public property in mass bulk at once, that's going to take off and just start spreading on its own throughout the whole forest, throughout the whole railroad track system, throughout the whole expressway system. There's acres and acres of, of plantable land. It's not against the law to do it. People plant flowers all the time up in there. So why not vegetables and stuff? Because a vegetable is just a flower that we can eat. Well, not only that, but see, now I've also already instructed the homeless people out there that aren't doing anything anyways to go to the dumpsters behind the grocery stores and pull out all the, the produce that they throw away at the end of the day <clears throat> and take the seeds out of that and go around through the landscapes all around town and start planting those seeds where there's drip irrigation lines already. Well, well you can do more than that. Uh, things like celery and stuff, you cut the bottom out, and you can actually get it to root. Yeah, my friend Ralph, actually, Dave, you, you've you been introduced to Ralph. Yeah. Um, he's the one who told me how to do that, regrowing vegetables. Here's a question, though. For things like the produce, like let's say, um, you know, tomato seeds and hamburgers and whatever, things like that, isn't that Monsanto-fied and you really don't want that stuff growing? Yeah, you're probably right there. So we need to start getting this into organics and getting those organic seeds out there. Yeah, course, what, what would actually be better, though, is if you if you took that organic, well, not necessarily organic, but just that food waste, if you dig, like, a two-and-a-half-foot hole and you bury it, it's, it's low enough down that the seeds are just going to rot down there. They're not going to grow. But as it decomposes, it's going to make the land more fertile because all that's just going to deteriorate into, into fertile soil. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's not going to grow your, your Monsanto nasties because those are going to rot down there and the worms are going to go through it. But it's going to enrich the soil if you bury that stuff instead of throwing it away. You know what I've done here with my mom's garden is she's got a compost bin. And um, I just took all that compost because she throws everything in there, the seeds and everything. And um, I just took all that and I mixed it all up and I spread it through the garden and mixed it in and added water. And the next thing you know, a whole bunch of vegetables popped up. Cantaloupe and tomatoes and peppers and onions yeah. and all kinds of stuff. Well, you just don't, you don't want to Monsanto that. That's, that's the yeah. only thing you've got to be careful. Well, you, well, most of that isn't Monsanto. Uh, most of that just uh, was grown um, commercially using regular fertilizers and pesticides and stuff. But the thing is, if you plant the seeds and stuff and you're, you're using organic technique, it should be all right. It'll, it should make an organic vegetable. Now, here's a really easy way. Now, um, there's a, a book by the author Mel Bartholomew called uh, Square Foot Gardening. He calls it all new square foot gardening, but I'm sorry, raised bed gardens are nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but he's developed a soil mix that's really good, and they sell it at Home Depot. You can buy it pre mixed in bags, or he even tells you how to make it yourself. Yeah, um, I, I make my own soil mixes because I have my own little mulching area behind the bushes, and I mean I take. Um, Twigs and bush cuttings and and yeah. you know lawn waste, everything, and I just let it rot down back there. And, and anything that still ends up like you know too big to mulch down into dirt, the twigs and stuff I break them up real small, and I sprinkle them into the garden because the smaller the pieces are, the more the more moisture, the moisture saturation, <laughs> and you're gonna have water retention which is very important and um, you know the, the stuff that does break down into dirt I just shovel that out and I sprinkle it in the garden and you know you want to you want to sprinkle it though because you don't want to disturb any plants that are already growing you want to do it at a light sprinkle but after a few years of that right light sprinkle you're adding inches of soil so um in my mom's yard here there's apricot tree there's a plum tree there's a couple apple trees, there's a pomegranate tree, a bunch of citrus trees, and a peach tree. 
And all of that's about starting to become ripe right now. The apricots really? are yeah, the apricots are already falling to the ground. So I've already got a bunch of apricot seeds. Um, <laughs> then uh, the the plums will be done pretty soon, and then I'll have a bunch of plum seeds. And these pomegranates here, though, that's just full of seeds. And uh, the peach seeds as well. I mean, these trees are loaded right now. So I've already got a bunch of seeds that I can start sending your way. Pretty well, um, as long as it'll grow in a, in a northern and, and survive the winter. Oh, yeah. I mean, so this stuff will work. You can get this stuff to grow there. I mean, okay. these, these trees, like the plum tree, the apricot, um, you know, I'm not sure about the peaches, but these are all um, trees that go dormant for the winter. And then the next summer they come back out and then they're alive again. Yeah. It's the only the only better. problem with with trees when it comes to Chicago, as far as fruit growing trees, I, I told you this before. Yeah, the they rotting. need to be they, they need to be sprayed, otherwise they they rot. Yeah. So that's those are kind of a a problem. Um, but anything that like anything that might grow a a berry instead of a full a full grown uh, fruit would be good. Yeah. Because that's not so so problematic, and um. I just I can't resist but do this. Um, you, you see how how Jay's coming up blue over there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well. Sorry, I just couldn't couldn't help myself on that one. <laughs> I just I just had to go all Eiffel sixty five. Well, I, I'm actually not. I'm actually not blue in per in person. I have a witness. <laughs> actually, I was wearing red. Well, well, hey, you know, if if um if Jay dyes um his hair back to a full brown and puts on a cloak, he's Obi Wan Kenobi. But but if he dyes it white and puts on a Santa suit, you'll be expecting presents from him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I lately it has been so amazing how I've been able to just walk through the streets and walk up to these people that are just hanging out and not doing anything, and I share this idea with them, and all of a sudden their whole entire world just pops. Like they all of a sudden wake right up real quick. And that's how it that's works. How it works. I mean, I've got people with warrants out for their arrest that would get thrown in jail if they got caught. They're like, man, I believe in this so much, I'm going to do it anyways. And they start running around and they start grabbing cardboard to make signs. And then they start going through the trash to find things to make artwork out of. I'm walking through the streets now and I'm all of a sudden seeing homeless people <coughs> sitting out on the street corners, like knitting and weaving things. And I mean, they're already doing this on their own. They're not waiting for me. Yeah, I mean that's that's why um, you got you know that's why it's also important to laugh at the trolls, especially online. Just laugh at them and and yeah. give, you give them the troll love because then everybody out there who sees you do that, they're like, "Wow, you got balls! I want to know what you're up to." And then mine's well, open because if you try to force somebody, wake up, you fucking sheep! You need it, you know, like like um, certain certain um. Certain ports we all know. I mean, I'm not trying to daven around or anything, <clears throat> but but um, you know, you don't, you can't scream in people's faces and and get them to wake up. You have to be that example that they are that they are observing, and um, then they'll get curious and go, "How in the fuck did you just do that?" Then the mind opens. But if you try to bitch at them and force them, my way is the best way. You need to listen, or you're an idiot. No, 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 no. Like so many of these people tend to do. Well, how is that any different than the rest of society screaming at people on overload? You need to go to church. You need to obey the government. You, there's all this screaming. People are done being screamed at. Uh, well, we we actually got trolls to admit that that they're being paid for doing what they're doing too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that was great. Uh, um, there's this one guy, um, um, Donnie Gilson, that um, you, you know, the the government doesn't like too well, and um, there's these paid shills that go and fuck with him, and you know, I love the guy, he's awesome, but and I've told this to, to his face, 
Donnie, the reason they're fucking with you is because you make it so easy. You get so offended. But anyway, so one of his trolls, one of his trolls tried to mess with me. And I was begging him to troll me. I said, you need to keep trolling me because you're making me money. And um, the troll's automatic reflex was, oh, well, I don't want to troll you because um, I only get paid to troll Donnie. I don't get paid to troll you. So that was like an admission right there of government kill influence. You know, I had the same uh, issue in uh, Occupy, and I would drag people in. I would bait them with certain comments that mm -hmm. I knew exactly what I was talking about, but they were controversial issues that people really take sides on. And so I'd just say something, and I'd bait them in, and they'd all start jumping in and attacking. And then I'd start just going off on the whole truth and not uh, trying to attack them at all, but I'd just start going off on the truth and then... The next thing you know, I had all these people that were about to just unsubscribe that are all of a sudden like, wow, now I just can't wait until you do it. You know, I can't wait to see what you're going to say next. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, ju it's just like Je Jeff Bliss. Um, you know about that guy, that, that kid. I, I just did a video on him. Um, apparently this, this stuff went down only like days ago to where, you know, this kid just got pissed off at, you know, this tyrannical teacher and stood stood up and, and spoke for the, the rights of the students and now these videos are going viral. Um, I just did up a blog, you know, if people go on uh, Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy on, on Facebook, um, I have the blog up there or you can go to Paradigm dash shifting dot deviantart.com um, the, the blog is uh, titled that a teen a teenage precedent has been set and I have a few um, a few videos you know linked in there as far as this whole um, you know Jeff Bliss situation and he he's just going viral on the internet and it's great and that's not only what teenagers need to do that's what the rest of us need to do. Not just teenagers confronting teachers and saying, hey, do your job. And now that teacher's been suspended, by the way. So yeah, that was awesome. pro Props, yeah. But we need to do this with politicians. We need to do this with government workers. I mean, I won't go into, into details, but there have been times where government workers and police officers and things like that have tried to screw with me. And all I had to do is show them, and I did it in a lighthearted way so that they were embarrassed. I just showed them that I know the law and they don't. And they got terrified of me and they backed off. Yeah. I, I had the same thing happen to me. I was leaving work the other day, and I just went over from, from work to the Best Buy so that I could go ask them about the MP3 player that I just bought because I was having issues with it. And when I got out of there, I was listening to my music and I was dancing around all happy. <laughs> And a police officer followed me from work all the way over to where I was at the store and then waited for me to come out of the store. I was just having a great old time, dancing around all happy, spreading love and peace and everything everywhere. And, um, you know, and, and he came to me and he, he just got out of his car and approached me and he said, uh, you know, so what's going on? And I told him, you know, and I showed him the MP3 player. I was like, man, this thing's so cool. And then, um, and then he said, well, you got any ID? And I said, well, yeah, I do, but... I mean, I don't really have to show you. Was I doing anything wrong? And he was like, well, no. And I was like, well, then you have to have some kind of probable cause to suspect that I was doing anything wrong to get my ID, huh? He was like, well, you're completely right about that. I said, I know I am. And uh, he's like, well, but is there any reason why you don't want to show me your ID? And I said, well, I'm just trying to exercise my right, you know, and it, and it actually helps you out, too, because you have this right as as well, and you can exercise it anytime you want, and that'll keep you from getting drugged down and manipulated by corrupt people out in the world. And, um, and he liked what I had to say right there. And then all of a sudden, um, I explained to him what I was putting together and how I was going to get all this going, and I was going to explain to people how to stand up for their rights as well. And I was going to get us all to start explaining to each other how that we're all going to, you know, stand up for our <coughs> rights and everything. And and he really liked what I had to say. And he's asked me, well, you ever been in trouble? I said, nope. And he said, oh, man, I can't even say that. I said, well, you know, maybe I've had tickets from here and there, but I've never done anything wrong, you know. Yeah. And, Reminds so me of this one incident. Um, if you do a YouTube search for Fence Witch, you can get the whole story. But that was my 
psycho um, next door neighbor, and we, and whenever the cops would show up, we we call them uh, her babysitters because, I mean, she'd call the cops on us for every little thing. If I was out there watering the lawn, she'd call the cops. If I, if we were having a bonfire in the backyard, which is not illegal at all, she'd call the cops. Any little thing, she'd call the cops, right? Yeah. But there's this one time. Because a lot of these cops are really arrogant, so, you know, they got a badge and a gun, they think they own the world, right? So we got this little um, garden space on the on the front uh, public property ahead of our house, the, the easement there, which is completely legal. And he's going off on this tirade about, you know, acting like he owns the whole fucking world. And he's like, I could take these plants, I could grab them. And I could pull them out right now. I could just yank them out. I could pull them out right now. I'm a cop. I could do that. I could just pull it out and destroy it all. But why would I do that? Why would I do that? And I said, I don't know. That'd be fucking stupid. You look like an intelligent man to me. Why would you do something that retarded? And, he, and he's like, um, well, I'm just saying, you wouldn't like it very much if I went in there and destroyed that, would you? And I said, well, on one hand, no, but on another hand, it would be kind of funny because when you ended up grabbing your bare hands on that wild rose bush I got in there, we'd be hearing you down the fucking block. So that would actually be kind of funny. <laughs> And you know what he did? <laughs> he shut the fuck up. He got in his police car and he left. <laughs> oh, man. I had a, a situation in my last neighborhood in Apache Junction where I had a bunch of, there was a bunch of meth dealers and whatnot down the street. They started cooking meth in their front yard. They were driving me crazy because all of a sudden they were so tweaked <clears> out that they thought that I was narking on them. And so then, um... <laughs> They kept coming over around and breaking into my house and then rattling my doors at night, making all this noise everywhere, just driving the whole neighborhood crazy. So at a certain point when they started cooking meth in that trailer out front of their house, I called the police and I was like, hey guys, this is just way too horrible. The whole neighborhood's all up in a roar about all this and nothing's getting done. Can you guys just at least drive through the neighborhood to see what's going on? And they said, no. No, we're not going to sit out in your neighborhood. And what? I said, that's not what I asked. I asked if you would actually just drive by. They're up there all night long, every night for the last few months. I mean, there's noise ordinances. When people throw parties, you guys have to come out and come and tell them to shut it down. I mean, I pay my taxes. I pay for this to happen. I mean, that's your job. Do your job. Yeah, you know what's funny? They're all ticket happy around here, and we always tell the cops, you know, if you would park a car right by our stop sign at the corner here, people blow that stop sign a hundred times a day. You'd make a million dollars in tickets, but they don't want to do that. They want to hassle you over water in your fucking lawn, but yeah. they don't, they don't want to mess with people blowing stop signs. Although the funny thing is, as much as Spence which called the cops on us. We called her fence, which you'll, you could see the reasons online. But I'm not using her real name, obviously. Legal liability. But um, she called the cops on us so much that even though half of those cops didn't really like us that much, the other half we made friends with. And then the half that didn't like us, at the very least, ended up respecting us. So there was one time, um, a little bit after that, my dad got into a bit of a jam that um, these cops were kind of unfairly hassling him and, you know, brought him down into the station, right? But because of fence which he already knew half the cops there, so when he was in holding, this one police officer snuck in, acted like, you know, they were being a badass. You get over here now, you come out of here. As soon as the door shut and they're out of the way, they start laughing like, yeah, sorry, that was all an, an act. I had to look like I wasn't breaking protocol. They brought them into the back room with the rest of the cops, and they were eating bologna sandwiches and donuts and drinking coffee and just laughing it up. And, you know, I'm, I'm at home, like, worrying about what's going on here. Like, oh, my God, I haven't heard from Dad. Are they still messing with him? Is he arrested? What's going on? Dad comes back home, and he's like, oh, my God, I love Ben Switch. 
because of her, all the cops liked me down there. We were just sitting out in the back room and drinking coffee and eating bologna sandwiches and donuts, and we were just shooting the shit and bullshitting and laughing about everything. So that was just great. Now check this out. This story even gets a little bit better, right? So after these, um, after that all started happening, and I called the police. The police went and let these uh, meth and meth dealers know that it was me that called. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing you know, all of a sudden they realize that it is me, and they had uh, actually so lost in their minds, came over to my house to hatch out this plan of how they were going to break in as soon as I left. Mm -hmm. And I heard them outside talking about this, so I left, and then I went and called the police again. And uh, after that, they started following me around town, and um, and it got to the point where the these people following me around town finally got pulled over. And then I heard them, you know, just sitting back and laughing, you know, oh, what are you doing following this guy around, you know? Oh, we're not doing anything wrong. And, um, and I got away from them at that point. But then I went and called the police and took off and went over to a public place um, over to the Walmart building across the street. I called him and they showed up and and then he's like, "What? Well, what's this all about?" And I said, "Well, finally, you know, you guys have pulled over the people that have been following me around and causing all these problems. So what exactly was going on?" And he said, uh, "No one got pulled over." And I said, "Oh, really? Because I saw you. I saw a cop car behind these people and I heard him." saying, you know, everything that was going on before I left, and he said, oh, well, that was me that pulled him over, and I said, okay, well, then what were I all about, and he said, no one got pulled over, I said, okay, now, wait a second, first you tell me no one got pulled over, then you tell me it was you that pulled him over, and now you're telling me that it wasn't, you, that no one got pulled over anymore, and it was right in front of another cop that wasn't involved in their game. Uh, you know, I would have, I would have, um, I just, I just them. turned I around, I turned around, and I said, now, look, I've just used your own game against you, and I've caught you in your own lies. And by that point, he backed down, and he started sweating. And he started getting scared. I would have laughed, and I would have, I would have asked, you know, I'd like to see the ordinance where it says it's legal for you to use my tax dollars to lie to me and manipulate me, because yeah. that's what you're doing. Now, now what I did then, cause, because I, asked, I, I was asking him to see what he could do about this situation. And he said, well, what do you want me to do? said, I don't know, what can you do? And he said, well, I'm not going to do anything. And so I was like, well, once this other officer said, okay, look, we can do this and that and the other thing, I said, okay, now see, this officer here is giving me options of what you guys can do for me in my situation. And you over here, all of you are doing is threatening to arrest me and lock me in a mental hospital. And I've already, you've already done that to me because they did. They came over to my house, and they broke in, and they took me out, and they locked me in a mental hospital. And I proved to them that I wasn't crazy. So, and my parents actually called to have them arrest me. It was stupid. So, um... Yeah, that's really dumb. Yeah. So, anyway... There's, there's laws against that here in Illinois. You can't be for forced into a mental hospital unless you're convicted of a serious crime. Oh, as soon as the hospital realized I was there against my will, they let me go right away. But, um, yeah, so anyways, um, I told him that they had already done that. And that officer that had threatened to do that to me was one of the people who ripped me out of my house and threw me into that hospital. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and then he's like, oh, really? I want to see the records of that. And I was like, well, you can go get them. They're right there. And, um, but, yeah, so at that point, all of a sudden, these, this nice officer that was trying to do the right job pretty much took that other officer over to the side and kept him over there and turned to me and he said, you know what, you're a really smart guy. You're going to go places in this world. Yeah, they, they, always, <laughs> they always threaten to lock you up as a matter of fact. Um, there were these one cops that came with a, the, the very last fence switch ordeal that we, that we had, um, which, I mean, she's evicted now. It's a whole big long story, but these two cops that showed up they were admitting how disappointed they were that there was no fight and that they, they live to bust heads and that's the only reason they're, they're on the force and they live for this shit and, and that if they get called back out again and, and there's no fight for them to break up and get involved with, that everyone's getting locked up because everything is peaceful. So it's apparently being at peace is against the law. 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, now, now here's the really cool part, though. This goes back to my little um, incidents in showing up at the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors meeting. Mm -hmm. Because at first, when everyone was coming up with these top ten reasons for why to get rid of Sheriff Joe Arpaio, we were actually um, commenting, um, be opposing uh, Agenda 7, which was to give more money to Joe Arpaio to counter the meth problem, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, but he's the reason why it's so bad. <laughs> and and um, giving him our money is just going to make it worse. So those were pretty much what we were saying. And the Board of Supervisors knows exactly what's going on because they even instruct their own kids to not answer the door when he shows up because he's a bad guy. <laughs> and so they are afraid of him. And they can't do anything about it when they, they're alone. And so basically we just showed them... Um, that they've got a bunch of people behind them and they better start working with us to get that guy out but at first they wanted to just dismiss all of our comments by saying this is unrelated to this issue it's well what about all this evidence he has well, against uh, Obama no. and that whole thing is that all BS? well yeah pretty much and he just did that as a publicity stunt I mean the thing of it is is this guy he he's illegally arresting people and destroying their lives you know, he, he puts them in jail, slaps them with all these fines, now they can't get a job anymore, and they're screwed, and they end up on the streets, right? And then he goes into these companies, and he, he like, uh, supposedly arrests all these undocumented workers, but they all have documents. <laughs> yeah. there, was a, there was a printing company that I know personally that happened. Yeah, they went in there and said that they were printing up illegal documents, and that uh, there was all these undocumented workers, but that's not the truth. The truth was that they were all documented. They were not printing any documents, and the owner of that company was a Sheriff Joe Arpaio supporter until he did that. No oh God. Uh, yeah. But the thing of it is, is what he does is he does this stuff to put it on the news to all the rest of the country so he can get all this funding from out-of-state donors and snowbirds that have no idea what really goes on here. They just think that this guy is some really awesome, badass sheriff that's cleaning up the West. And so he's basically, at this point, gotten a bunch of money to put all these billboards up around town saying, don't sign the petition. Well, you know what's funny about that? Hmm. Ne negative advertising is still advertising. Exactly. You he's know, advertising the petition. Yeah, most, <laughs> most of the people that have ever come and, and looked at, well, anything I've been involved, involved in, um, usually it's because they heard it sucked and was full of shit and that I'm crazy and stupid and people should stay away from me so they, they went and checked me out just to see whether or not that's true because they got curious really I need to find out if this is actually true like so, Alex Jones yeah so I've gotten you know a lot a, a lot of people you know paying attention to my stuff because of shit talkers and trolls and whatever that's why I love the trolls I'm like come on troll me you're just raising my demographic. Let me give you a big fucking hug. You're, you're trolling this video. Would you please troll all my others as long as you're doing this one? Why stop there? You know. <laughs> Man, I still love what you did to Jim Carrey. That was hilarious. <laughs> but, um, uh, anyway, so they were going to dismiss all these comments, right? Until I stood up there in front of the. Oh, wow. Is that another situation of lights over Phoenix again? <laughs> Anyways. Um, so, uh, so, um, yeah, I know, I see him all the time. So, um... Well, you I'm know this thing, this thing, I'm looking at the thing, it says one viewer? Maybe our viewer is in orbit. That could be. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I walked up to there, and, and I was the first person to actually submit my form for public comment. Because all these groups, they had put together their top ten reasons, and then they had all their ten speakers that had already put their speeches together. And I didn't need to put a speech together. I did all mine on the fly. And then I changed it on the fly again right when I got up there to speak. Because I realized what was going on. They were, t they were shoving everybody out. They didn't want to hear anybody. They went ahead and approved all that money for Joe Arpaio. And then they moved everybody over to public comment. So I was the first person to speak. And I went up there and I said, okay, well, you know, if we're going to be complaining, if we want to have a right to complain... Well, then we need to present a solution of our own, I would think, you know, because... Not only present it, but be willing to be a part of it. 
Yeah. So, so many people who want to present solutions want to present it and go, okay, here, no, no, no you go do it. So You're, I it's turned. Not up to me. So I turned to them and I said, and I've done just that. I've developed safety net industries, and I've got my website started, www.safetynetindustries.com. I've got my web, my Facebook page, facebook.com slash safety net industries, capital N-P-O-A-Z. And what we're going to do is we're going to start bringing all these safety nets to the people that need them. By the them. way, link, link me to that in Facebook chat, which I, I was actually doing a search for your, your safety net page on Facebook, and no results would uh, show up. So um, that would be cool if you could, yeah. Right now. And um, as, far, as far as what you're saying about uh, Jim Carrey, this is a perfect chance for me to test the screen share option so that I could show the viewers um, exactly what it is you're talking about. So I'm going to see if this actually wants to work for me. It may or it may not. Let's uh, find out here. I'm trying to select it. Screen share for Hangouts. Select a window to show in the in the Hangout. Um, okay, come on, you silly thing. I've never used this before, so. There you go. There's the link. Okay, cool. I'm clicking on. It's saying desktop, Google Hangouts, and there's other. Okay, here we go. Um, start screen share. Let's see if this is actually going to work. I told it to start the screen share. Um, yeah, what it does, what it does is change your picture to the screen to the screen share, and then the others can place it up and see it. Yeah, are you, okay, it's starting to come up, I think, a um, little bit of a lag time on my end. Um, let me know if you guys can see anything. I see a Google Plus. There it is. Okay, oh, it was there for a second. Okay, it's there, but it's flashing between. There you go. Okay, do you see the Jim Carrey thing? There it is. Is it, is. Not, is no, it on the screen? Oh, it is for me. I just okay. got a black screen. Okay, well, let, let me make sure that I have that selected. Okay, cool. Now it just went um, to black screen. Okay, it, it should be recording properly, even if there's a bit of delay lag for you. I know there's some for me. It keeps switching back and forth between black screen and not black screen, but it should be recording properly. <laughs> so I have the image up, and it's got Jim Carrey, and it's got me. Jim Carrey is saying... People against banning guns are heartless motherfuckers unwilling to bend over for the safe bend for the safety of our kids. Bend over is more like it. Yeah. Jim Carrey. And I said, let me play a little jazz for you, Jim. I think we all know what scene I'm referring to when I say, let me play a little jazz for you, Jim. The, the thing, you know, in uh, Bruce Almighty. One of the greatest delusions is when brainless motherfuckers hope that the evils of the world are to be cured by legislation. Dave Kelso paraphrasing Thomas Reed, 1886. Now, link down here is what you're talking about as far as what I did to Jim Carrey. So I'm going to go to that link right now. And this is rather funny because I decided to go to Jim Carrey's um, Facebook profile. And the the newest status that he had on there was actually rather synchronistic, as we're about to see when the when the page decides to load. I guess the Google Hangout is uh, slowing down um, other web capability because it's probably sucking up a lot of bandwidth. So just um, bear with me a second while I traverse the links. Um, I don't know how much of this this is actually showing you. Or not just yet, but hopefully it's actually recording to the video in a proper way, um, even if maybe it's a, a little glitchy on our views of it. I'm still waiting for the um, the image to load properly. Please forgive the delay time. Um, Google Hangout, Hangout is apparently um, sucking up a lot of bandwidth here. Normally this would load right away. 
so, uh, so I'm just gonna bear with me here. Um, this is still like partially frozen here. I guess this is really sucking up a lot of. Ah, uh... oh, there we go. Here it's coming. I just gotta click into it um, a bit more as it lets me here. Hopefully, come on, create the thing. Um. Hopefully we can see all this. Jim Terry, smite me, almighty smiter! <laughs> and I said, if you insist, I can hold that note all day, buddy. And I put in the link to the image that I was just showing him. <laughs> <laughs> he called for you to smite him. <laughs> yeah, apparently so. Now I'm going to try to turn off screen share since we... Yeah, you're back. Up! Oh, what happened to Dave? Are you there, Dave? Can't hear you, Dave. You got your mic, mic muted, Dave? Yeah, when it, refre when it refreshes like that, it'll mute your mic on when you come back in. Testing one two three. There you go. There you go. Yeah, that was that was weird. It like um it, when I disconnected the screen share, it like uh booted me out for a second, and then um it pulled me back in. So um to finish what I was saying about the the board meeting, um when I was explaining to them what I was doing, I I explained to them the whole issue is that. All these people, they're, they're, they're running around trying to put their lives back together with all these broken safety net programs that were broken in the first place, and they're not really doing anything to help anybody. And so pretty much that's what's causing all these problems out there. Now, I just listened to them talk about most of what they were talking about was about taking care of our infrastructure and making sure our rights and freedoms were taken care of. And they didn't need to be dealing with all of our petty issues that we kept bringing that just kept getting in the way of them taking care of business. And um, and I, I had just listened to how this officer over here was just in a gunfight with some, you know, drug traffickers and, you know, real criminals and he got shot and killed. And there was another officer that was in the audience there that got shot in the head and he was recovering from that. I mean, he had a patch wound on his face and everything. And, um, and he was was about to ready to turn, you know, to active duty, and um, and and I basically explained to them that it's just not fair, and it's it's high time that we all start standing up and taking care of our own issues. And I explained to them how this was going to bring all of those safety nets and assistance programs to the people that need them, because when they're in a stressed out situation where they're just on the brink, they don't need to be having to go through all of these red tapes and bull crap in order to put their lives back together you know we need to actually bring that stuff to them and help them out of these situations and lift them up rather than making their issues worse and um and when i got done speaking with them i th this time because i had gone to another um a city council meeting before and when i was speaking out to them they pretty much dismissed me and said you can sit down now right mm -hmm. but I actually got to make them look like a bunch of bigots in front of the next generation that was coming up. That was cool. There was all these children that showed up with all these artworks saying, I support equal rights and freedom and everything. And I was calling on them to stop prosecuting the nonviolent offenders and go after the violent offenders. And they basically turned to me and told me to sit down. Nash is back. But, um, so anyways, this time I didn't get that response. This time... They actually thanked me for everything I was doing. 
and I put smiles on the faces of all of those board of supervisors. Faces. Katarina's gone. That was really cool. So then I turned around and I went to go back to my seat and the police reached out to me and they said thank you so much for everything you're doing. And then I went on my way back to my seat again and there was a, a representative from the Salvation Army that stopped me and he said I, I just think what you're about to do is the greatest thing in the world and I want to work with you on this. Here's my card, contact me. I've all of a sudden got all these people wanting to contact me. And nice. I, I had even sent my plans to President Obama appealing to him saying, you know, this is how you started off in the first place. As a community organizer, somebody that wanted change, you know, you went into this with all the greatest intentions, but we turned our backs on you. And you really needed our support at that time, and we didn't have it. And all of a sudden, you got wrapped up with all these corporations trying to drive you into things you shouldn't have been doing. And, um, and, now, and now he's got um, now now he's got um, drones uh, blow, yeah. blowing little children to pieces overseas, and now he wants to do the same thing here. He was um, just recently saying that. When he doesn't want to do when it. it when, when it comes to um, no, he said that when it comes to striking um, uh, targets in this in this country with drone strikes, then you know any amount of collateral you know damage is acceptable. So basically, you know he could take out ten s Sandy Hooks. It's uh, completely acceptable to him. And yeah, you know, but who's, who's he's, putting he's, those uh, words in his mouth? Oh yeah, I know. I mean, he's so <laughs> country boy. But yeah. I'm saying, you know, but, see, now what but, I, but it's just like he's still going along with it, though. Well, you know, kind he of. Could, he, no. could, he could no, get up in front out, of the nation and say that this government is insolvent. I resign. There's too much corruption. There's well, nothing I could do. My hands are tied. Let he, me, won't, he won't do that. Let me explain to you what, what I just witnessed happen. Is that I explained to him that his marriage is now falling apart. Because, you know, before he got married to Michelle... They had this argument, and Michelle had told him that, look, the only way to fix these problems is in the communities. There's no way that you're going to be able to fix these problems in the government as president. And, you know, they're both right. In a sense, they were both right. Because, um, and but right now it's driving their marriage apart. Michelle is coming out publicly saying that she's now a single mom, right? And Obama, you can see, he's like looking like a miserable wretch, and he just hates everything that he's doing. Even though he puts on a, you know, an image like he's okay. Well, um, you know, all of a sudden after I sent these plans to him about three different times, you know, on my way home the other night, I, 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 I was in Mesa, far away from an airport, but I saw this plane that very much looked like Air Force One flying very low over my head in a place where planes do not fly that low. And I watched them dry, flying right into Phoenix. And he wasn't there to talk to me. He was there to talk to our government. And he left me a message saying that, look, I understand what you're saying, but we can't get involved with this. You need to do it. You all need to do this. You mean he left you a message symbolically or he responded to your email? symbolically left me a message saying, look, I hear you, but we can't get involved in this because we can't be your saviors. We're here to talk to your governments, but you are the ones that need to put this together. Even though he says the opposite on TV. Yeah, that's the whole thing. He has to keep playing that game to keep driving the force to make all this happen. You see, he what he did was he did a really good, bad job. He basically made it to where now we are, the, the government is nearly bankrupt. You know, they're spent their way into a hole that they can't get out of. So basically he, d he did a better Hitler than Hitler. What he did was he told everybody that he was going to undo everything that Bush did. But all he really did was he went in and did everything that Bush did way worse than Bush ever did it. As a way that we have no way of denying that these problems exist in our government. Yeah, well, I think I think he even did a better job than Hitler, if you get my meaning. Yeah, I do, and um, and basically at the same point now, he's exposed all of these corporations for what they are. Now we all know what they're doing. 
So now the whole country is pretty much woken up to the fact that, wow, we are in control, and we are under slavery. And if we don't do something quick, we're going to fall apart. And you know, everything is already set up now, and poised us at the perfect time to pull this off. And so what he did was he basically destroyed all of the parts uh, that were holding us down, exposed all the parts that were holding us down, and left the option in our hands to take back our future. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, but... Um, you I know, know, there's still, I know there's it's still a bunch of there's... bad ideas. It's a bunch yeah. of bad actions that happened. It but makes those it bad makes actions sense, but it makes were made sense. to wake us up. Yeah, it makes sense, but that doesn't excuse them. No. I mean, it doesn't excuse the fact that, you know, most of those children survive those drone attacks and they're, they're being our limbs blown off. And I've seen the pictures where they're laying there, you know, crying, slid open like, you know, um, a stuffed pig and, and everything else. And um, I think he could, have, he could have made his point without going that far. Yeah, and, then, that's and then on top of it, he's saying he's more than happy to do it here. Well, simultaneously, he's all pretending to be all teary about about Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. Oh, we gotta we gotta remove more rights for the kids. Boo hoo hoo! Pretending what I to cry. He's what? he's he, he what? he's a power monger, and it's gone to his head. What it's I see, really gone to his head. What I see of what what I just saw is that he just gave me the silent wink. That what I, what we're about to do is the right thing to do, even though he can't really jump in here to do anything about it, and he needs us to pull this off and start throwing this party that's going to emanate everywhere. And then at that point, we're gonna be able to just turn our backs on the government and laugh at everything that they ever did. Well, you also gotta realize something too. Um, you know, all he wants is a resolve to the situation. You yeah. gotta re realize that he doesn't care about the people. He's got the the typical Illuminati attitude. Yep. We're the we're the peasants. Yep. We are we are the lambs going to the slaughter. It's just he's decided he's 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 done farming lands. It's uh, lambs. It's it's too much hassle. This human farming thing is too much hassle. So let's not let's not discredit him here. He's you know he's on team dark. He's a frickin' Illuminati. He he has no no problem with killing men, women, children painfully. Whatever he looks at us as lower than insects, like the rest of all of them do. The difference now is that he's starting to realize that this whole human farming business just ain't worth it. We're at a we're at a point of human consciousness where it's become more trouble than it's worth, and these guys want to retire. They yep. they want they want to go live in their mansions and you know masturbate to their porn and whatever else they're doing and they want to give give that ship of state to us and say we're done with it, um, but they're not doing it as a nice thing. They're not doing no. it as like oh well we're so proud of you we want to give you this gift. No. They're saying fuck you. We yep. don't want your bullshit anymore. We hate you. Get away from us. You suck. We don't like you anymore. Fuck off. That's what they're saying to us. Yep. So let's not let's not make a mistake and, and think that you know Obama's doing this good wonderful thing. He's saying fuck the, the loudest fuck you in history. He's saying you all take care of yourselves now because we're sick of your asses. We think better of cockroaches than we think of you, and we want you to maintain yourselves. You have become too much trouble than you're worth. We're sick of you. Fuck you, and we'll kill off 6.5 billion of you if you don't take our hint. And I just see it as the prime opportunity for us to finally pull all this off. Because all of this stuff that they've done everywhere, mm -hmm. we can make use of all of it, and we can turn it all into good. Because you know what? People are also under the illusion that in order to understand something, you have to agree with it. That's why people push away from knowledge. Oh no, I can't understand the other po person's point of view, because then I might get tainted by it or agree with it. No, the more you understand a person's point of view, the more you can hold your own and disagree with it. But you can do it in such a way that you're more informed to where 
instead of trying to fight the government and fight Obama and fight, 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 you can have enough information to say, all right, look, Obama, I think you're a scumbag, and you think I'm a little peasant bitch, and that's cool. We can laugh over it over a beer. Um, we can remain enemies, but we don't have to fight. Let's figure out how to straighten out this mess that we're all in. None of us want it, and we all don't want it for different reasons. We don't want it because we want our freedoms back, and Obama and the elites don't want it because they hate us so bad now that they don't want to deal with us at all. So we all want the same thing for two different reasons, but the fact is we all want the same thing. Yeah. So, so both sides got to chill the fuck out and work together because the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Well, the enemy of the light side and the dark side is the situation. Neither of us like the situation. So we got to work together, even if it's only temporarily, and, you know, bring the situation to a close so that we can finally evolve as a civilization as we're supposed to, and the elites can get in their spaceships or go to their mansions or go to the moon or whatever the fuck it is they're going to do. They can get the hell away from us because they don't like us anymore, and that's perfectly fine. Good riddance to bad rubbish from our point of view. They can go do whatever as long as they're gone. They want us gone, we want them gone, so we can work together to make each other gone, but not in a way that destroys the planet. And eventually, they're going to be so lost in their own misery, and they're going to see us having all this fun, that eventually they're just going to drop all their shit and want to join in. Well, see, they're, they, they're, they're a slave as well as we are, because uh, you become a slave to material things, your possessions own you, not... Um, not you owning your possessions. Basically, yeah. what's happening is they're treating us like slaves. So what's happening? They become a slave to the slaves. Yep. Exactly. Because you know, there's nothing wrong with owning tools as long as all the tools are there to serve you. But when you're owning stuff just for the sake of owning stuff, then it becomes more than you can manage. And when it becomes more than you can manage, it's starts to manage you and and the, and the way it manages you you're not really gonna like it it's kind of like all of our uh, technology all of our machines that do everything for us right well we still have to keep feeding all those machines all the time and we all of a sudden have to keep you know putting gas in them and 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 all of a sudden we now become enslaved to our machines I mean, we used to be able to go out there. We had all kinds of jobs growing crops and stuff like that. But now that we've got machines to replace it, well, what replaced all those jobs? Well, uh, the, well, well the thing is, there's nothing wrong with that. We just have to no. liberate our machines, too. We, yeah. have to, we have to make these machines so they can last a thousand years and, uh -huh. and give, them, give them a limitless energy supply. So then, as the machines do all the work we're, we don't want to do... That frees up our time, and now we can explore new ideas and expand civilization instead of contracting civilization into a consciousness landfill that's cool to fit. Yeah. I mean, really, I saw this thing go across Facebook that said, if you don't like the way things are, get up and change the channel, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I replied back to that, and I said, you know, I tried to get up and change the channel. I kept pushing the button, but it wouldn't move. Nothing was working. So I pulled it apart and I looked inside and I found all these wires and hoses that are crisscrossed and mixed matched everywhere. There's everything's connected to the wrong places and you know a lot of this stuff isn't even there in the first place anyways. Oh, uh, did you lose me? No, no, not that I know of. Oh, there was this thing that said are you still there? But anyways, yeah, so I said, you know, a lot of this stuff is just needless anyways. It's all a bunch of overbloated stuff. It's in the way of me figuring out how this is supposed to connect. <clears throat> so I went through it, and I figured it all out, and I got rid of the garbage, and I figured out where these hoses and wires are supposed to really connect, and I started putting them back together, right? And I put it back together, and I pushed the button, and it worked. <laughs> So kind of, I, I've pretty much figured out that everything, every, all of our problems is just a virus in our society. Oh yeah, it's a societal meme. And, and not only that, but the host is defending the virus. Yeah. And, and, and 
basically I've I've formulated a serum in order to cure us of this disease and so now all we have to do is administer it to the public it's a one big giant syringe <laughs> well it's more like getting the public to administer it to themselves instead yeah. of crying to mommy and daddy just handing out the syringe and leaving it everywhere and like let everybody start injecting themselves <laughs> Like, all right, time pe people, time to wake up. Hey, I got a question for you. What's that? In your opinion, do you think that um, the powers that be monitor um, conversations like this? Yeah, I know they got computers that record oh, yeah. everything, process everything in statistics, but do you think that for things on this level of conversation, do you think that there are actual humans that are there that take the time to, to sit down and actually review this stuff. Do you think there's actually a staff involved? Well, see, basically you've got Echelon, right? That keys in on keywords and everything like that. Um, we know that Facebook was pretty much developed by the CIA anyways, and it was like the best thing that ever happened to them because they got everybody to just willfully give them all the information they ever wanted instead of having to spend all this money to go and track it all down. So let me uh, ask you something. Do you think that our conversation about Obama, in your opinion, will that cross Obama's desk? Oh, I'm sure of it. But at the You're same sure point, I'm say, at the same point, I think they're starting to finally wake up. <laughs> yeah. I think they're finally starting to look at realize, that, wow, these guys maybe have a point. Well, how about this? If, you, if, if your Air Force One flyover is what you think it is, how would you like to test the theory? I got a good idea. I'd love to test the theory. Here we go. If this particular video is going to end up crossing Obama's desk after the broadcast is done and it goes up on YouTube, I got a little bit of a challenge for Obama. How about he rings your doorbell? Not his Secret Service agents, not bullies, not his little monster thugs, but him. I mean, he could surround himself with his thugs, that's fine. He needs the protection, of course. But him, personally knocking on your door, walking through and saying, okay, I've recognized that you peasants want to take uh, responsibility, so I'm willing to, uh, to start the conversation, but only for as long as you you guys are willing to do the work. As soon as you expect me to do anything, I'm out. But I'm willing to have the conversation as long as you guys are willing to do the work. I would oh, like man. him to show up at your door and tell you that, or words I, to that effect. I that can't, is, that, I that can't is wait. the challenge to Obama. I can't wait. If you are right, and if Obama doesn't watch this and laugh his ass off and go, man, that Brian thinks he knows what he's talking about, shit. Air Force One only only uh, flew over that way because I wanted to stop at Taco Bell. You know, if he's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> if, um, if you're right, then, um, and this crosses his desk, then, um, he should have no problem with uh, showing up at your door in the near future. But if you're wrong and or this happens to not cross his desk for whatever reason, then you're going to be hearing the, uh, the, the crickets chirp, um, you know, until uh, death or ascension or what have you do you part this 3D realm. So this is just a little test to see if not only he's listening, but if you're right. Because if you're right about his perspective, then he should have no problem ringing your fucking doorbell. Yeah. None at all. None at all. I'd love to talk to him. And, uh, you know, if you're right, he's also waiting for us to invite him. Yeah, pretty much. So, so okay. I'm sure he knows where you live. He's flown over your house. So there's the invite. When he shows up at your place to have that conversation, then we know. He already or, has my address. I already uh, sent it to him to the White House. Or he, or listen, also invite him on Google Plus here, and he, he can converse oh, he, with all he, of us. He would, he 
he would never do that because he's still got to keep up pretenses for the public. Yeah, I just want to personally sit down and talk to him. And I want him to bring those beers that he just made. Because that sounds like some good stuff. Hey, and you know what? If he, if he is listening, I got, um, I've got also got two words of incentive for him. Sarah Sinclair. Supposedly, Sarah's given him a piece of her mind more than once. So, Sarah Sinclair. If you're ever looking for a light worker's handshake there, <laughs> or light and dark, I don't know, whatever metaphor you want to use. But, um, yeah, maybe maybe those those two words, Sarah Sinclair, maybe that, that might... Um, be of a little persuasion for him to show up at your door too. This is finally the time that the forces of light and dark need to merge forces. Integrate instead of instead of vampiring on each other. Yeah. Because we both face a common enemy and that's ourselves. Well the common enemy is the common situation because light has been vampiring on dark and dark is vampiring on light. It's the yin and the yang. In because, darkness there is light, and in light there is darkness. Yeah, because the, the dark couldn't couldn't have that that drive to feed on light if it didn't feel threatened. Exactly. And light couldn't have that drive to attack dark if it didn't feel threatened. Yeah. So it's time for the little fucking children to grow up. I kind of see it as like a white flag being waved and the arms about to be laid down. Well, I look at it more of a polarity thing. It's more of a polarity thing is man and woman. You're just getting them to mate, so to speak. Now, here's the thing, though. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't have to trust each other. We don't have to like each other. Quite personally, to the best do I frickin' part, I'll trust Obama about as far as I could throw him, and I'm sure the reverse is also true. We don't have to trust each other. We don't have to like each other. We all just got to chill out and have some fucking objectivity and be willing to at least temporarily work with each other towards a common fucking goal. Because if we're not willing to do that, this planet's fucked. It doesn't matter if you're a power elite or a fucking commoner. This planet is fucking fucked if we don't all knock it the fuck off. But we can't do it by pointing fingers. We can only do it by trying to explain the situation. Because as soon as we start pointing fingers at each other, we've just taken sides and we're in a fight again. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm not, you know, the only fingers I'm pointing is the ones that say we are all responsible for our own actions. So I'm responsible for mine. You're responsible for yours. Jay's responsible for his. Obama's responsible for his. Just so happens to be a law of the fucking universe. I didn't even make this thing up. You know, what you put out is what you get back. Matter and energy, so on and so forth. It just is what it is. So I'm not looking to blame anybody for anything they didn't directly do. It's not about blame. It's about taking responsibility for what we did. So what Obama did, he did. What I've done, I've done. What you've done, you've done. So, you know, let's, let's We're not all the blame game. Yeah. I mean, let, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. And seeing as that was Jesus who said it, that should tell you something about Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. 11, 12, people. Yeah. <laughs> what, 1, 12 here, but we just missed 11, 11 on your time. Although it just recently flipped over and I was talking about Jesus, so there you go. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Christ. <laughs> but you know what else I want people to understand? People think that the Illuminati, which is all but a buzzword anymore, are this big, unified, powerful force against us all. That's not actually true. What they are besides some of the most insecure fucking people on the planet, is there a bunch of little fucking kids on a game board called Earth, and they'll all slit each other's throats and, and sell their own fucking mothers to win the game, okay? So it's factionized, and these factions have been playing towards an end game, And now they're starting to realize that end game is not possible. They've gotten in too deep. And even Brzeznu Brzezinski, whatever the fuck his name is, on a little meeting not too long ago, I saw the video clip where he actually admitted that. He said that this isn't going to work. 
this is totally not going to work. So he actually admitted it. So they are, they, they're as desperate as we are. And desperation breeds genius. But people got to understand, these are not all powerful beings that have more powerful than we are. Oh, Ashley is calling me um, via phone. I'm going to actually link this into the hangout here. Hold on a second. Um, hey, Ashley. Hey. You, I, I, I had to reset my computer because it froze, and every time I add myself to the hangout, it kind of like mutes me out, and then I can't hear anybody. I can't even hear you. Weird. Well, you know what? You're on the hangout right now. Say hi, everybody. Hello, hi, Ashley. Can you hear Ashley, everybody? I can hear her. I can't I see can her. Well, yeah, you can't see her because she's calling via her cell phone. Oh. I've, mer I've merged us. I answered her phone call, traditional phone system, with Skype, Internet, and then blended that in with the um, hangout. Man, you're smart. So she's she's in the hangout with us. You just can't see her. She's there by phone. All right. So welcome back. It's better than nothing. Hey, you know what's interesting? I just noticed we've gone from six down to three. <laughs> yeah, we have. And this is almost like this is almost like we've got God here in the center. And we've got Jesus and Satan over here. <laughs> and, then, and then we've got um, we've got the uh, the Holy Spirit in the in the etheric force coming yeah. in. Right. The yeah, feminine the energy man. bringing the life to everything. This is hilarious. Yeah, this is and, funny. And, and, and on Mother's Day. Yeah, <laughs> on Mother's Day, man, that's so true. And you know what's funny about that? I I gave my mom. Um, some flowers before she went on our cruise for a Mother's Day present, and then I bought her some chocolates, and then I gave, I, I pulled them out and I put them on the counter and handed them to her this morning as she woke up for Mother's Day. And see now, my dad, he had always had this dream of starting a, a family business. Right? I have a question. Well, hang on a second. And I thought, well, okay, he just died a few years ago, about a year and a half ago. And I thought, well, the only way for me to give my dad his father were to stay present is actually to put all this into motion. Yeah, well, I got a question. When you uh, gave your mother the, fl the flowers, did you sign it, your son, Satan? No, I just had your flowers. Okay. Because I know you said she, she, kept, she kept calling you Satan, so... Oh, she, she actually well, signed it as for being from Satan. She always, she always says that I'm surrounded by Satan, right? And um, and you know, I always I always took that as her saying that I was Satan, right? But at the same point, now I kind of get it because you know, as this, this whole time I've been going through my life, I have been in, attacked by the darkness all over the place. But being attacked by the darkness all over the place was just a way for me to build myself up stronger. It's kind of like a Buddhism, you know, concept where, you know, all this outside, all this outside weight and everything like that, it can push down on us and everything, but, but inside us is, is where all of that, that true energy is. And we can build that up by pushing back against the outside forces. You know, what, do you just like, about, what do you think about that? She's kind of missed some participation time, so let's give her a little... Ashley? Ashley? Hello? I'm still connected on the... Whoop! Skype call just dropped. Call. Oh. That was weird. Can you get her back on here? Or? I can try. Um, give me a sec. Maybe we just had some cellular droppage here or something. You know what's funny? I've always ha had this, this... Hold on, it's ringing. Hey, I lost... 
I lost you guys. I don't understand what's going on. I don't Every know either. Every time I try to talk to you, I can't hear. Can you hear everybody now? There? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just can't figure out what is can going you hear on. Us? How about everybody else? Hey, you guys, start talking. Let's see if Ashley can understand you. Um. Yeah, I'm here. I can hear hey, Ashley. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. But can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's clear. Like It's kind of choppy a little bit. You can actually see me, but yeah. Well, this is why I don't own a cell phone. or a pain. Skype gets that way sometimes. <laughs> well, that's another enslavement device because the same the same methods that um Tesla invented for global energy to pass that around that's the exact same as um as Wi-Fi signal because he was working on it. Um, not just for energy, but for radio trans mission, and um, Marconi ended up beating him to it because, um, you know, J.P. Morgan bent Tesla over and fucked him in the ass, but that same technology could be used to transfer wireless uh, internet signal and everything else, so, um, you know, if we were using Tesla technology, um, we wouldn't need radioactive microwave fucking receivers for one. One, and number two, the signals would be um, high broadband and, and crystal clear. We wouldn't have any of these problems. Yeah, and if they sent if they sent it scalar wave, it would be instantaneous too. Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of funny. Um, you know, we're talking about J.P. Morgan, right? Well, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I did hear across the internet that Bernie Madoff. From his jail cell, has just implicated J.P. Morgan Chase as being part of his Ponzi scheme. Really? Yeah. Uh. So as he's sitting in jail, all those crooks are sitting out there laughing their asses <coughs> off. You know, he just kind of sat there and he thought, you know what? No, I'm going to expose them too. <laughs> you know, at the same point, I look at the government pointing the finger at Bernie Madoff. And I think, now wait a second, he had a little tiny Ponzi scheme compared to the big Ponzi scheme that the government set up called Social Security and Medicare. I mean, those are got to be the biggest Ponzi schemes I've ever seen. Don't, don't forget uh, the Fed. Yeah, exactly. The, the, and you know the what? the biggest Ponzi scheme the government had set up. And, and they, they admit it. They admit yeah. it because our money looks exactly like Monopoly money. And if they if they really wanted to set up Social Security right, what they would have done is they would have made it into a mutual fund so that all of our money would have gained interest over time. Well, if you go on uh, Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy on Facebook and look through the photos, I got a photo of uh, our, our current Federal Reserve money aligned with the uh, Monopoly money. And it's yeah, exactly the same. And it says the Fed thinks this is funny. Well, what's the what's the monopoly rule number ten or whatever it was? Eleven. Rule Eleven. Eleven. Yeah, where if the bank runs out of money, you can use tokens or keep placekeepers or even just use slips of paper to make up for what it doesn't have until the bank has money again. Mm-hmm. And that's never, and we just keep using the slips. Yeah. Well, we don't even use the slips. We just make up numbers in a computer system to represent. I mean, those are still slips. They're digital. Yeah, it's a placeholder, like you said. There isn't even enough money in the monetary in our in in the system in in circulation to even be able to come close to paying off our debt. Well, you know what? Money is debt. If you paid off all the debt, there would be there wouldn't be one dollar in circulation. Exactly. And you know, really, when it comes down to it, the government did not build this country. <clears throat> They just used money to convince us to build it all on our own. So basically, money was worthless in the first place. It was just a way to convince us, us to, to build this whole place. And it's, now a that way, it's, a, it's a way to convince the sheep to move without needing the sheepdog barking behind us. It's the carry yeah. on the stick to the donkey. The illusion of freedom, where we think we have choices, but really we don't have any at all. 
we have, an, we have individual choice as individuals, but we also have the choice to be deceived. Yeah, that's true. But we're not going to be able to fix this system by changing little bits and pieces of it. Really, we just have to create a whole new social model that's going to make the old one obsolete. Well, Ashley's back. Well, via video, she's no longer on Skype. All right, she's back. Yay, welcome back. Yay. Oh, I can't yeah, hear you. Oh, it says I'm now. Can you hear me at least? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. yeah. yeah. I had to reset my computer. Yay! Don't we love yeah. technology? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> what was this? Just starting to lag real bad. Had to clear cache and everything. Oh lord! You know what this whole conversation's reminded me of? You know that um. I think it was either a 50s or 60s song, um, Teenager in Love. Oh, yeah. Well, as far as how the, the, the police treat everybody and the scandals and everything, um, when I was a kid, I made some parody lyrics for the refrain. Um, looking, at, uh, looking up at the sky, it's so pale. Why must I be a teenager in jail? <laughs> <laughs> wow. All the jails are privately owned. They're traded stocks, as are your birth certificate. Mm. Hey, Dave, you want to you wanna hear another song I wrote? Yeah. Oh, are we there? We're all being quiet so you can do oh. it. Kicking out the system. Let everybody listen. We're, we're taking back all control because we don't need their shit anymore. Countless pointed fingers, those blazing gleaming stairs have never really gotten us any fucking where. Those fat cats up in Washington pulling all the strings, passing their legislation that pushes us to extremes. I just want to live my life. Yeah, I'd like to break the mold, but they tell me that I cannot or they'll cram me in a hole. So we're kicking out the system. Let everybody listen. We're, we're taking back all control because we don't need their shit anymore. All the corporate greed, their tricky bait and switch, takes our stable sets away so much it makes my temper itch. Playing cup games with our lives, making us fight to resist their lies. In the end, we all realize we're all like mimes in a box of air, floating around you. We just don't care, chasing our tails around everywhere. Fuck the system that never listens. They only want to keep us down so they can kick us while we're on the ground. Fuck the system. It never listens. They only want to suck us dry so they can spit it right back in our eyes, keeping us so underfed. They'll make us plead. They'll make us beg for all the scraps dropped on the floor. No, never more will we succumb to this. All enraged, we're so fucking pissed that deep down into the dark depths of our insanity, we're realizing now that we can't hardly see. All these games have been played with us. We just can't see. We're stuck. We're fucked. We're screwed. And there's nothing we can do. Everything we try to fix just makes it all more confused. So we're kicking out the system. Let everybody listen. We're, we're taking back all control because we don't need their shit anymore. I like that. Well, would you like to... Um, awesome. Would you, would you like to hear one that... Um, I made called uh, Need for Unity. Yeah. Well, this I've actually uh, made the audio. I'm still working on the video, so I can actually just play it through with full instrumental and everything. Does it, let me know if it's too loud or something. <laughs> you get to the beginning of it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Mystery never peace, but it should have seemed to rhyme. As a circular, it's a time spin round. There's something different we can see. Now 
we have a frame of reference and sensitivity and sensitivity to unity, the need for unity, everyone will have a in the company of Spain, famous car guard the acquisition of unwanted influence, when they saw what turns up, by the really Somebody will go and they'll flag my account for being in the Empower Network, and I'll have to make a brand new account. Why do they flag you for being in the Empower Network? I don't know. I honestly think that they're just jealous. Like that's the only thing. Yeah. I've made three three accounts, and all of them have been flagged. So it's just like really. <laughs> it's crazy, you know, and it's probably just people trying to destroy a good thing. It is. It's. it's a lot of people being jealous. There's a company called Utopia that's, I guess, they're trying to copy the Empower Network. And oh, I think I saw them. Yeah, they're a scam. They tried to contact me, and I was like, don't ever contact me again. Yeah. And I just, like, deleted them. I was like, seriously. I have been through way too many of those scams because, you know, they did prey on me. There was a point where I thought, you know, I really want to make some money sitting here online and that's just. One, two, three. Oh, there is Dave. Yeah, it got dropped and then and pulled back again. Um, what part did it leave off at before it shit me? Um, it was talking about Unity, and then um, and then all of a sudden it just went away. Okay. Yeah. Um, did it get to Bill Hicks? I don't think so, not no, yet. No, okay. no, no, it didn't. I think that people on the right chair can't believe I think that people on the left chair can't believe It's echoing a lot. Yeah. Go back to bed, America. Go to bed, America. Go to bed, America. Go to And to hear the rest of the song, you can go to ReverbNation.com forward slash Time Warriors, stream it, download it, whatever. <laughs> All right. 
So yeah. Katarina went to bed already? Yep, yep. She headed off. <sighs> yep. You know, I've been like, I, I get up in the morning and I spend all day long working on all this. And I work on all this all the way up until the point where I just fall asleep in my chair. Because I, I, a quote came across and it said, you know, um, full-time evil cannot be countered with part-time activism. Yeah. Right on. That's... So I figured out that, okay, well then maybe full-time evil needs to be taken on with overtime activism. So I pretty much work 18 hours a day on this every day. So when most people work eight hours a day, I work ten more than that. Well, I found another trick to it. Uh, don't make it work, make it play. It yeah. In everything you do, and then it's not work, it's effortless, it's ease and flow. Yeah, because I'm, ha I'm having so much fun. My pond stuff and my fish stuff is integrated with the stuff I'm working on as far as sustainability, and then I've got my paradigm shift stuff and my music and all that and you know and that stuff gets the word out and I make money doing it and so on and so forth I mean why not integrate it into what you're doing it shouldn't be this extra side task on top of what you're already doing stressing you the fuck out it's no. just play not work and by the way one thing I'd like to clear up for people as well because there's a lot of people who don't understand um, you take terms such as um, light worker or dark worker or Illuminati or team light or team dark or way show or whatever. People need to realize these are all metaphors. They're euphemisms. They're, they're buzzwords. It's because we haven't mastered telepathy yet. And we can't say no. this fucking thing over there dealing with that fucking person over here and have anybody understand us. So, what are you talking about? Star seeds, crystal kids, indigo kids, light workers, dark workers, Illuminati. What? Are, these are all just you know, they're just fucking words. It, it's just a frame of reference point. It it doesn't mean that you know we're trying to compartmentalize down to any sort of specifics and say, well, you're not in if you're not in the fucking in club. But, you know, even a lot of so-called light workers treat it that way. Instead of being on their own path and saying, hey, this is my path, here's my resources, use them if you want. These so-called love and lighters are like, fuck you, motherfucker, if you don't do it my way. It's like, where the fuck did the love and light go? Where, you yeah. know, what the yeah. hell? <laughs> and then there's these people that That's think so they That's so true. <laughs> I, I completely, like, relate with you on that because my team leader, is, he's all like, love and light and he's all about sharing everything that he does but when I need help he's like you need to get all in and I'm sitting here and I'm like what the hell does that mean get all in like I am all in dude I'm on your team like what do you want me to pay for everything like what does that have to do it means obey his ego all in means grab his dick and do the shaky shake that's what all in means he's coming at it from a point of of ego and what really irks me is these light workers who also they start to understand a bit of the metaphysics and quantum physics and then they get caught in the inversion trap so they sit there thinking that if they meditate on their bed going oh my oh my my frequency's rising oh my that you know that's somehow going to do something in the world well you know what when you sit there and meditate and you're really raising your vibratory frequency what that means is everything on the external in alignment with your frequency is going to come flying at you and everything not in alignment is going to come getting the hell away from you so the opportunities come at us and the things that are in our way fly away from us so what do we do oh my god all these things that are flying away I am attached to them. I have my addictions to them. I can go into self-victimization. Oh, why is the universe fucking picking on me? Yeah. And then when the opportunities come, oh my God, big scary opportunities trying to victimize me. I can go even deeper into victimization. Then what's even worse, 
There's all the motherfuckers who completely misunderstood that movie, The Secret, who treat quantum physics as if it's the fucking quantum version of the Home Shopping Network. Thank you for calling the universe. May I take your order? We accept Visa, MasterCard, and go fuck yourself. You know, it's like... So the biggest it's problem, the biggest problem people have, if you ever notice, they always, it's a big common question. I can manifest no problem, but I can never hold on to it. I can never keep what I manifest. Well, no fucking shit. The reason you're manifesting it is because the universe wants you to pay attention to how it's being manifested so that you can learn how things work. Raise your consciousness. It's yep. knowledge. Then you can take that knowledge and put it into practical application. So, yep. of course, they lose the manifestation because the universe is like, all right, uh, your, your, uh, your free will is saying you want to be a lazy bitch. So I'm going to surround you with the reality that reflects that lazy bitchness. So they lose everything. Well, you're you know, really, you're really smart. Like I really like the way that you are because it's it's nice to be around people that believe the same things instead of being around people that are negative all the time and they're like, I hate my life because it's like, oh, I'm going to have a shitty day. Well, yeah, you are going to have a shitty day because that's what you're putting out there. Yeah, but the, thing, but the thing is, though, that they are your opportunity to raise their frequency through compassion. The first step is to tell them, it's okay that you're feeling shitty. The only reason that's doing you any harm is because you're not owning that emotion as a form of your own opinion. So you're creating a negative feedback loop. You're feeling shitty about feeling shitty and being siphoned down this black hole of misery. It's a hamster wheel. You see, we're taught so much uh, self-victimization that, you know, we're not owning our emotions. You can't change what you don't own. It, emotions are the same thing as what Brian was talking about as the masters becoming the slaves or us becoming the tools of the tools. You're you know awesome. what I'm saying? It's the yeah. same thing with emotion. When we see emotion as something on the outside of us coming at us, attacking us, then it's like, oh my God, I'm so weak, I'm so horrible, I'm so miserable, I can't do anything right. Well, they're in a negative feedback loop because they're feeling guilty about feeling guilty. They're judging themselves for judging ourselves. Sad about being sad. Guilt. I mean, it's just it's a negative feedback loop clusterfuck. If they would just give themselves the right to be like, okay, I'm feeling shitty, I'm feeling angry, I have the right to feel that way. As soon as they do that, they go, oh, wait a minute, I don't like it that I feel that way. So then, they're taking power. Because then it's like eating a food you don't like. Are you going to feel victimized and keep eating it and eating it and stuffing your face with this horrible, nasty food, which, which, which only tastes like dog shit because that is exactly what you put in between the hamburger buns? Or are you going to go, you know, I really don't want to eat dog shit. I want to eat something that's actually good for me that I like. So I'm going to stop eating this. Because I'm owning my opinion here, I have an opinion that I don't like this. And because I'm owning that and not seeing it as something victimizing me, now I can shift over here and make a new choice. Man, but that's why like people don't make choices. So awesome. Well, you know, and a lot of the times people look at the choice, and they're usually the choice is between dog shit and canine feces, right? <laughs> well, what sounds better? Usually canine feces sounds better than dog shit, right? Uh, isn't, isn't that kind of like the uh, the the lesser of two evils? Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have something to add on this subject because, like, you're talking about how to get people that are negative to to say it's okay. Well, the thing that I ran into when I was in Chicago is I had people they were like, "Oh, I don't have money to pay for this hotel," and they just kept dwelling on it. And I was sitting there like, "I came here and I don't have any money at all, and I don't want to sit here and dwell on it." And I'm not going to because you guys are just, that's all you want to focus on. So I left and I kept putting it out there that I didn't have to stress out about it because I was going to have money come to me. I didn't have to worry about it. Some guy came up to me and gave me $100. I'm not kidding. That like it really happened, and then on top of that, people were coming up to me, buying me food, and like like I wasn't stressing out about what I didn't have. I was just happy that I was there in the moment and like living in the moment and not having to stress out. And you know, how do you get past the point where those people that are negative, they're just there to bring you down? Like, how are you supposed to tell them it's okay? Here, try to try to do this instead of 
this? Like, how do you get to that stage where... You, you exactly just answered your own question. You, mm -hmm. have, you do it by doing it. Because it's not, it's not what they said that's bugging you. It's the energy they're caring about it. Now, mm -hmm. if they were telling you that as just a form of honesty and not trying to vampire off your energy, <laughs> your response would have been different. You would have said, oh, well, that's no problem. Come chill with me. Come chill with me. Come this way. I'll, well, we'll have a good time, and you know, you can you can just come chill with me, and, and don't worry about it. And then you know that they would have answered with, "Oh, cool, thanks, yeah, let's go chill." And then yeah. you would have given them an opportunity to shift. But you were detecting that they wanted to feel justified in their self-victimization. They didn't want to shift. They weren't simply being honest about their situation. If they were being honest about their situation. They just explained it and just said, you know, I'm really just not sure what I'm going to do about this. And then they're just being honest. They're being honest about the fact that they're in this uncertainty. Yep. But instead, what they were doing is locking down the reality of I'm fucked, I'm fucked, I'm fucked. That's I'm all fucked. they kept doing, too. And I, I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm leaving. I can't be around this anymore because it's just bringing me down. And yep. once I got away from them, it was like a whole different thing. And I had a guy come up to me in the airport. His name's Kevin. He's my first sponsor in the Empower Network. And he literally, he was waiting for me to get through the airport. You know when you have to go to the checkout and like they make yeah. you go through that scanner? He was pretending to tie his shoe because he was like, I felt your energy and I just wanted to talk to you. I wouldn't like, go through the scanner. I'd definitely take the uh, totalitarian <laughs> sexual assault molestation option. I had to. <laughs> I just one of them while they're doing it. <laughs> and, uh, you know what I would do personally if I was... I was being groped by them. I'd be like, "Ooh, hey, sexy, you come here often?" I'd like, <laughs> first before, uh, I, I have a better idea. Before right. feeling me up, uh, you yeah. are gonna give me your you just take two ping pong balls. What? <laughs> two ping pong balls. <laughs> you take two ping pong balls and put them in your pocket, and when they go down the search, you just pull out the your ping pong balls and ask, "You want to check them?" <laughs> we, I gotta tell you, I gotta finish telling you what happened. I met this guy. I get out of the checkout, checkout from them searching me, and he's like, "What is this?" Because I was wearing my Empower Network tag from the event. Mm -hmm. and I told him about it, and he was all excited. He's like, "He's like, what is this? I could just feel your energy." And I was like, "Well, it, we write a blogging system, but I honestly think it's like a, it helps. It's like a company that helps you." be a different person. It teaches you how to grow and be a different person and like the way I explained it to him, like I, I was in the moment. I can't explain it other than that. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. He, he, joined, he joined my company because first of all I was in a hurry. I had to get to my plane. So he gets in his bag and he has nothing to write in. He pulls out underwear. Like his white underwear because it's the only thing that I could like that he could write on. I swear to you guys I'm not kidding. And like he's like this is the only thing I have to write on. So I wrote down my email address and my business number on it and then he joined me like a week later and then like he sent me out five hundred dollars to pay for the Costa Rica or whatever the five hundred dollar product is because he knew that I needed the money and I sat there and I like I wasn't stressing out how to pay for it and the guy that I sponsored sent me the money and like like that's one of those things where if you manifest it and if you don't focus on it and you're like it'll come to me it'll come to me it came to me and I still kind of am in shock because of it. Because this guy that I met, like, came up to me in the airport. And he's just, like, helping me. And I'm, like, I'm the one that sponsored him. Like, I don't, like it's just crazy to me. If well, you, you know love it, they will come. Well, yeah. you know what? Let me... And you Let's... know what really it is? What it really is is that there is nobody that is going to do for us what we won't do for ourselves. You make a good point, which brings me yeah. to the question I'm going to ask Ashley. You already said, what you put out is what you get back, right? Yeah. That means all these quote-unquote negative people that you can't seem to shake sometimes are a result of something that you're putting out, but you're not facing on the, on the internal. So <laughs> instead of judging them and going, all oh, these negative people... Why don't you ask yourself what's inside of me that I need to face that keeps creating that reflection? And that thing that you 
need to face is the self-victimization. You're not realizing that all these negative people are an opportunity for you to step into your sovereignty and also to respect theirs, to hold your frequency and say, hey, look, I'm going to be honest with you. This is my perspective on it. Now, I'm happy to be your friend and help you shift out of this if that's what you want. But if that's not what you want, I've done the spiraling and self-victimization before. I'm done with that. I've learned my lessons there. It's not my cup of fucking tea anymore. And if you're still learning those lessons, I respect you for that. You can do that, but I'm, I'm done with that particular party. So if you say that just as an expression of your sovereignty and your honesty, and you're not judging them, you're not looking at them like a swarm of fucking bees coming at you, accosting you, then you're facing that block that you have inside of you because mm -hmm. you're not giving yourself the right to have an emotional opinion. Number, Number one, one, give yourself, yourself the right, right to, to feel, feel that you don't like that these people are negative. Number, Number two, two, give, give yourself, yourself the right, right to understand stand. That this is a reflection of something still unresolved inside of you. And number three, that that reflection is that you're still holding judgmental expectations of others. So what you put out is what you get back. Oh, why aren't these people doing this? They should be doing what I'm doing. Oh, wait, that's a force of will. No, they shouldn't. They should be following their own path, and they are. And sometimes people's paths are a little difficult. Sometimes they're filled with self-victimization. Sometimes they're filled with fucking themselves over and letting others fuck them over. And that's their yeah. path of learning. And it's neither right or wrong, it's just the path. So when so you realize it's their path, path, you realize it has nothing to do with you. When you realize it has nothing to do with you, all of a sudden you're not holding the judgment inside of you. And if you're not holding it inside of you, guess what? Isn't it being reflected out there? See, I like your whole output on that because I, like, I get to the point where when I'm around somebody when they're being negative, I'll just tell them I'll like st I'll be like, can you please stop? And like for my with the people that I can tell that to is my kids, for example, because I I've told my daughter every day I'm like, the way you put like whatever you put out there is what happens. If you're like, oh I'm gonna have a bad day, I'm gonna have a bad day. It's like yeah you are gonna have a bad day because. When you wake up in the morning and you think you're gonna have a bad day, that's what happens. Conceptually, and, you're no. great, you're doing great conceptually, but but pay attention to what you're thinking, and feeling and doing at the same time. I can already tell mm -hmm. that when you're explaining that to them, um, if I were to rephrase the words based on your energy, you're explaining it this way. Look, you're victimizing yourself, and I'm feeling victimized by your self-victimization. So can you please take control of my reality for me? Can you please be responsible for my happiness and stop feeling victimized so that I can stop feeling victimized? It's How do I change that? I've got, I've got a way. Now, check this out. Throughout my time in developing Safety Net Industries, I was going around and I was trying to collect all kinds of people's ideas because I wanted to know what everybody thought about this. I wanted this to appeal to everybody. And I thought that I had the whole thing worked out, right? And so then I put it out there and I had all these people just start attacking me all over the place. You know, oh, this is, you know, the ills of Bachman, or this is coming from the Republican <laughs> Party, or, oh, you're some Adolf Hitler or something like that, right? Well, you know, and it <clears throat> took me a while to realize that maybe, you know, maybe some of this is is got some valid points to it, you know? Maybe I was going a little bit ego trip on it all, you know? And, and, and I was talking about how this was my idea and my plan, right? But really, when it come down to it, it was it was all of our plan. Mm -hmm. and, and so really, all these attacks on me were actually insight into the fact that I may have had some flaws in, in, the, in the whole design concept. And so really, in them being negative and trying to attack and destroy me, they just helped me design it by <coughs> trying to poke holes in something they can't poke holes in. And, um, and then I just, it just helped me further explain what I was trying to explain in the first place. Yeah, like, actually, Brian is completely right, and what you're experiencing is what Brian and I both call cognitive dissonance, because basically, it really doesn't matter what you do or say, it matters the energy you carry. The reason it's cognitive di dissonance is because we're taught it matters what we do and how we do it, what we say and how we say it. And not only that, but... You could say the same thing in one energy 
and it'll have the end result that aligns with that energy. You could say it in another, and, it, and it'll have the end result that aligns with the other. What you said conceptually, intellectually didn't change, but the energy you're carrying made the difference in the outcome. Now, also, at the same point, a lot of the times when, you know, like, like I have a friend that really helped me understand this for a long, long time. Right. Even though, yeah, even though he knew exactly what I was talking about, and he was adding pieces of it to help me develop it, he all of a sudden turned on me in the opposite direction when I finally got it pretty much in <laughs> order, right? And I couldn't understand why he was just completely turning on me until I realized all of a sudden that sometimes when somebody tells you that you can't do something, it makes you want to prove them that you can. Mm -hmm. That's, That's so, so true. true. Like, I've had so many friends they are like, this company isn't real, it's a scam, blah, blah, blah. And, like, my boyfriend, like, he's been supportive, but he hasn't been. And I've been the type of person where I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to keep doing this because I know it's going to work because there's people out there that have been doing this for how long? Like, it's this company's only been around not even two years, and it's just, like, seeing the proof is what made me keep going and, like, believing in myself. I didn't care that other people didn't believe in me. And that's one of the things I've taught my daughter. It's funny, I actually have a video where she... Um, she applied some of the stuff that I've been teaching her, and she's been getting not so good grades. And now she's like, she wrote a she wrote a paper about like believing in herself and like believing in what she's doing. And like her teacher like gave her an A in the paper, and she came home. She's like, "This is what you you did for me because you've been believing in yourself, and now it made me believe in myself." And I don't know how to explain how that makes you feel like when your kid brings home something that you taught them and they're showing their teacher it was kind of like it feels the exact same way yeah. when you've done that to for a friend yeah but with your kid it's I don't know it's it's the same thing as a friend but like when it's your kid it's a little bit different like because she's my stepdaughter she's not my actual like blood daughter but she it felt like real like connection and for her to be like talking about me like that in school, like she'll go in her class and she'll type in my name. And she's like, "That's my mom," and I'm like, "Oh, that's so cute." Like, like well, this you know, thing. it's the same thing like with best friends. Like me, me and Katerina, when I've been, mm -hmm. you know, supportive with her, and like she said that she, you know, she, she dropped my my name once or twice, mentioned me a little bit to people. Um, and in an empower network, but according to those people, at an at empower network, and um, I actually have the um, I can I can play that this back to prove it. Um, it was kind of uh, similar but different. Hold on, where did I put this? You're you're gonna laugh when I, when I show you this. I have the clip up on. Up on YouTube. I'm gonna show you something really quick. You can actually do a. There's like an app in here where you can put the video up for all of us to watch through the Hangout, but you don't have it set up on here. Let me see. Um. It says YouTube app. Add to the yeah. Hangout. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just Let me added try adding it. it and see if I can add it without things screwing up. Well, I just added it. It should it should come up. Yes, it did. Well, we all each have to add it. Okay. Because it says YouTube needs your permission. Okay, yeah. done. And then it says add videos to playlist, and I guess you just put the URL or whatever to the video. Oh, hold on. It's, it's asking me to allow access and all that crap, and then this... um. May or may not work properly for me at this point. While oh. you're talking, I have a question really quick. Like, I don't want people to think I'm nuts, but um, I have some weird stuff going on in my house. Like, really weird, like paranormal stuff. Oh, I have that stuff happen to me all the time. And um, this is one of the things I love about this company is join. Ever since I joined it, almost everybody that I've been hanging out with, they have the same thing. And I've actually been in a paranormal group called the Oregon Paranormal Society, mm -hmm. and we've gone on investigations and like I'm hanging out here and my friend Monica comes over and she's pregnant. She died having her son. And um, 
basically like was dead for over five minutes, came back to life, and ever since she's been able to, to see things, she went downstairs and my boyfriend's mom died in this house, and she's like, there's a woman like downstairs sitting on the bed, and I'm, I'm standing there, and I'm like, I didn't tell her anything, because I don't tell people that my house is haunted when they come over here. Yeah. I try to keep that quiet, because people might freak out, and um, like when she sensed that, I was like, okay, so she's for real, she's not lying to me, and then her boyfriend comes downstairs. This this freaked me out. I haven't told very many people. He, he like, goes downstairs and senses something really bad in the house, which something's been, like, holding me down in bed, like, pressing on my chest. Like, I can't get up, can't move, sleeping, like, I'm not kidding, like, I've been, my eyes have been open and I can't move. And yeah. my stepdaughter is 12 years old and she's had it happen to her. And this guy, his name's John, her boyfriend, he goes downstairs and he senses whatever it is that's been holding me down. He goes and he puts salt, like, along the lining in, like, the doorways. And then we're all upstairs, my dog's outside, my boyfriend's sleeping. And, like, not even 10 minutes after doing that, we go downstairs and one of the lines to the salt, like, was like somebody walked like a it looked like something put fingers in between it and through the door and i don't know what it is and ever since this was last weekend ever since then it's like certain times of the night like right now it's like almost midnight it gets like i get like weird feelings and i keep hearing things in my house and i have headphones on you need to get some sage and you need to purify the house yeah Definitely hey, Ashley, let me tell you something. As far as you worry about, about people thinking you're crazy, no matter what anybody says about anything, any topic that can be discussed, mundane or not mundane, any claim anybody can make about anything, there's always going to be someone who thinks you're crazy, regardless of what it is. So get used to that. I know. Yeah, I don't care. There's going to be a counter somewhere. You know, here's an experience that I can share with you. Um... My dad used to work for the city of Tempe. He was a plans examiner, um, the chief plans examiner. And, um, you know, he, he used to come home and tell us about all these dirty street kids that would be in the streets. You know, their their hair would be, they wouldn't wash their hair and it would just stick together and everything. And, you know, then I, I actually got in and I, you know, I went and hung out with these people. And I realized that those those were dreadlocks and they did that on purpose. Mm -hmm. It was a Rastafarian thing, and it's all about peace, love, and happiness. Yep. Well, then Tempe started this whole um, no loitering ordinance, right? And all these big yuppie companies came into town, and they turned the whole place from a hippie peace and love town into a yuppie business-run corporate town. Wow. And um, I had taken off, and I had gone on the road with the Renaissance Fair for about three years. And then when I came back, I, I became the caretaker there. So the whole Renaissance Fair was my backyard. It was pretty cool. Um, but I went back to Mill Avenue to go see if I could find some of those guys. And I was looking around, and they weren't anywhere to be found. And a guy walked up to me like he knew me. And he said, uh, I was asking him about all those guys. And he said, well, you want to see something scary? I was like, sure, why not? You know, I'm not afraid. I can... You know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. So, um, I, I go with him, and he's telling me the story that there, there, all those street kids used to hang out in the Hayden flour mill. And, um, one night there was a fire, and official the official story was that nobody got hurt. But there was a room that they forgot to clean up. And so, he took me into there. The fence was pretty much broken down. The building's big door was open, so you could just walk right into it. And he took me all around that building like like the street kids did. And he showed me the kind of the life that they lived in there. And then he took me downstairs, down, down about four stories to the north side. And um, he showed me this room. And when I got close to that room... All I could smell was like rotting pork, like, like human death. Oh wow! And I, 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 I recognized the smell right away, even though I'd never smelt it before. And um, when I got to the entrance to the door of that room, I saw blood dripping down the door frame, like blood drips down the door frame. And um, 
And then we were using lighters to walk around this place to light our way at nighttime. And uh, I walked into there and he showed me there was a stream of blood that came down from a room up above. A solid stream of dried blood that came down a pipe that went into a machine. And where the pipe bent to go into the machine, the blood had dripped down and it was a big puddle of dried blood all over the floor. Wow. And then I looked around the room and there was blood splatters all over the walls. And I could feel all this energy inside there and I, I could tell what had happened in there. All of these people were beaten to death in there. And um, and when I went to leave that room, because it was just, there was too much, we started hearing footsteps all around us and whispers and everything. And um, I was like, whoa, what is going on here, right? And I looked over a little ways and I saw wire that was hanging from the wall and it was being pulled on. And I shone my lighter over there and then the wire stopped getting pulled on, but... We still, the whispers, the footsteps, everything, it, it got louder and louder and more and more. And we called out and we said, okay, look, we're leaving. We're, 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 we're gone, okay? And we left. And I shared this with my dad. And he went to the police, or the fire marshal there. And the fire marshal explained to him that they would pull people off of the streets. And people would get coaxed into there. And they would get beaten and killed and robbed. And um, the police maintained a presence in there about every hour they'd go into there and they would arrest anyone that they found in there. And so that kind of all of a sudden begged the question to me, why is that building still open? Why don't they seal it? And why are the police maintaining such a presence there? It kind of makes it seem to me that they were taking all the people off the streets and killing them to install the corporate system that's there today. That's sad. Not long after that, I had told him about um, all of this police corruption in Pinal County, and mainly Apache Junction, Gold Canyon, and he confronted the police chief about it out there, and he could tell that the police chief was on the take kept making excuses for the way things were instead of trying to, you know, he, he knew what was going on. Well, pretty soon after that, my dad developed cancer, colon cancer. And at first, I thought, oh, man, my dad really did have a bug up his ass all these years. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it still, even though, you know, he, he, he had treated me pretty horribly throughout my life, I still felt bad. I knew that I was about to lose my dad, and we were going to have to work out our problems real quick before he was gone. And I spent a long time trying to work out our problems, but a lot of the times I had to just stay gone because it was just making everything worse for me. And, um, you know, he ended up going through about five years of chemotherapy and surgeries, and, and eventually it looked like he had finally gotten rid of it all. And now, as I was trying to deal with my issues with my dad and my whole family, really, because they all found me as soon as I joined Facebook. It was weird the way that everything happened when I got on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, my whole life started repeating itself when I came onto Facebook. All my earliest friends found me first in my family, and then my friends that I had later after that, and then my other friends that I had later after that. It was like my whole entire life story started repeating itself right there in front of me on Facebook. And it took me through a roller coaster of emotion I can't even tell you. And um, so I decided to just go ahead and pull out all the stops and start explaining the whole problem because I couldn't get my parents to really agree to go through this and, and deal with the issue. They just wanted to keep pushing me away and pushing me away. Yeah. And so I just decided, okay, this is it. I've got all of these friends that they tried to take me away from so that they could cover their tracks. And I'm going to just go ahead and tell the whole entire story right here, right now. Because he already had me arrested before to try to cover up his tracks. And then now I had all of the people that he was trying to hide this from right there in front of me. I just kept going to town and I wrote out 
I actually took it all and copied it and put it into a word and ten point font and it was 255 pages long. I wrote a lot. And um, he ended up calling the police and they broke into my house and they took me to a mental hospital. Seriously? Yeah. I was typing it all out on Facebook when I looked out and I saw police cars all of a sudden. Five police cars pull out in front of my house with an ambulance sitting there. I mean, we're talking Bradley Manning kind of stuff here. <clears throat> but I was able to get myself out of there and it just further proved my point when I came back to finish my story. And, um... After that, you know, we, we had dealt with things, but the last time I had talked to my dad, he hung up on me. And then he ended up dying suddenly from a heart attack in the front yard while he was trimming the bushes. And even though he had really made me kind of really mad, I still rushed right to the hospital to see him. Laying there on one of the same hospital beds in the same hospital that he put me in without any way for him to leave but I know realize now that where he's at and what he's going through he's realized a whole bunch of things and all of the things that he shared with me before he died are actually what I needed to put all this together yeah. and so it's kind of like the whole Luke and Anakin Skywalker thing mm -hmm. where I still saw the good in him and finally got him to do the right thing and I needed him on the other side to help me with this and um, there's a lot of people in my life that have died in weird situations like that that caused me a lot of pain but in the end I realized that they're right behind me right now making all this happen yeah and all of those, and it's funny that when I all of a sudden started putting all this together, I just thought of I needed a place to put this all together. I needed a building to make this happen. And all of a sudden, I thought of the Hayden Flour Mill. And I realized that, wow, that's going to be the way to release all these people from this, the, the chains that hold their souls still bound in that building. The only way to actually release their souls is to fill that building full of light and love and happiness and everything so that they can finally be released from the prison that they're still in. Yeah, I love that you have that kind of insight because people that I'm around that don't believe in any types of spirits, I don't sit there and force it on them. I just say, how could you believe in God and how can you believe in the devil and then sit there and say there's no such thing as any type of spirits. It's like when you die, your energy goes somewhere. Yeah. Like there's there's some type of... there's You go somewhere. That's the only thing that I can explain because when I've gone on investigations, I went to a place where a guy killed himself. Like he killed himself in a bar and <clears throat> like you could feel that guy still there because... Unfinished business. Yeah, it's like when you kill yourself, some he people... It's a traumatic experience that mm -hmm. really should not have happened, but it keeps their soul bound there yeah. until something finally comes in and releases it. Well, you know what? It's all. It's it, there's really little difference between the other side and here because it's still a what seems to be a physical reality construct, and it's still based on belief systems. Yep. And when you die, if you haven't gotten over certain judgments or attachments. Mm -hmm. Your judgments and attachments will hold you to those things, and it works the exact same way right here, right now. You don't have to die to have that experience. It happens to all of us every day, all the time. It's just belief systems. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what's really funny is um, when I, my last year, right before I became the caretaker at the Renaissance Fair, mm -hmm. uh, for the whole show, I lived next to this lady that I never met and then all of a sudden one day somebody came over and turned off her gas and screwed a screw into my three-wheeler tire and um, we both came out all kinda of mad about it and we met each other like hey what's going on you know and we got to talking and the next thing you know she's like she seemed like she was crazy but 
Uh, as I started listening to her more, I realized she wasn't crazy. I could all of a sudden real start to put together all the bits and pieces that she had been saying that were mixed in and shrouded with craziness, and all of a sudden she started making sense. You know what, Brian? If you could have a conversation with those people in that in that building, those souls, just like we're having this conversation now. They were my friends. Okay, well, if you could have like a face-to-face -face conversation right now with them, and <clears throat> you told them, look, just set set yourselves free, just just leave, just just go. There's no reason no. to hang around. I what, understand. What, listen, what you would find out is that there's nothing there's nothing trapping them. They no, might start handing you the same excuses to keep themselves trapped, the same as humans do here and this. So I can't get out of my situation because I'm I'm not good enough. I'm not no. smart enough. There's this force over here coming at me with this. All these excuses, their own excuses bind no, them, wait, just wait. like we bind ourselves. You Dave, I figured it out. Problem. I figured it out totally. <laughs> it was all for a reason. It was all programmed to make this happen in the first place. Yeah. Everything was programmed in order for this to make this happen. Well, I'm just going There's over all, this No, wait. I know. I know. But check this out. There is all kinds of incentives put out everywhere for me to make this happen. Because there's a lot of points where I would have just walked away. Mm -hmm. If not for all these pieces in place to make this happen. Now, this lady that I talked to there, that all of a sudden I met, started talking to me about the fact that she had this community in Colorado and um, she was part of this community in Colorado where like the Dalai Lama had a summer home and they had all kinds of different tech, extra technology stuff they were working well, on. Mentioned and, him. He was just in Portland not too long ago. Yeah, I know. I heard that. Now, um, I, was there. Now, I wish I was. I've been... Yeah. She started telling me uh, there was a lot of UFO sightings around there. Oh and, my god, Justin believes in that stuff. And there was constant, constant abductions that would happen there. And one of the guys that was abducted said that he had seen Jesus in a UFO. And um, that was right before, all of a sudden, with a group of friends all around me, we all saw this light drop down out of the sky into the desert. Really close. Close enough that I knew I could go find it. So... Without even thinking about it, I took off and I ran after it. And um, as I got closer and closer to it, I saw there was like a fog around it. There was blue, red, and green lights around it. And um, but the further, the fur closer and closer I got to it, the further and further it seemed to get away. Until all of a sudden, it wasn't even there anymore. But when I turned around to come back. All of a sudden, reality seemed like it was computer generated. And there wasn't anybody around anymore. The whole place was like a ghost town. Even though I knew that place was filled with hundreds of people, there was nobody around. And so, as I was walking back, I saw another light drop down out of the sky into the desert across <clears throat> the highway. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go after that one too. And so I went over and across the highway and I crossed the barbed wire fence and I started to walk a little bit further. And all of a sudden there was this electric shock that went all the way up from my legs through my whole entire body like I just touched a light socket. And I was like, what is that? You know, lighting my lighter around to see what it was and I couldn't find anything. And so I started going a little bit further and, um, and then all of a sudden there was a shock again. Same thing, like a, like a wall outlet just shocked me. And I'm in the middle of the desert. So I'm trying to explain this to myself by thinking maybe I got stung or bitten by something and it just felt like it was a shock. Or So I tried to make a little fire, you know, so I could make some light so I could see what was around me. But then the wind started blowing so much that I couldn't make a fire. And I just decided to go over and climb a telephone pole. So I climbed about three quarters of the way to the top and I saw this light coming through the sky towards me. It was weaving back and forth and coming my way and then it all of a sudden it disappeared. And at that point I felt different. And so I decided, okay, this is over. I'm going back home. And I climbed down to the thing to about two feet off the ground. And um, 
And I thought, well, I'm only two feet off the ground. I'm just going to jump off. So I jumped off, and I fell ten feet, and I hit the ground and splatted. I was like, whoa, what was that? How exactly what the... And I said, okay, this is too weird. Okay, I'm leaving. And I started walking off really fast, and as I was trying to walk off really fast, I kicked a choya cactus. And, you know, those jumping cactuses? Yeah, the one, yeah. The one that jump out at you. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of that. Well, anyways, I, um, there's actually like a static and electricity to them that, that can actually kind of cling to you. But they've got reverse barb on their thorns, so where as soon as they grab, they don't let go. So, right. and um, I was wearing sweatpants at the time, and these choya balls were in my ankle, in my leg, like so deep that they were going in one mm. side and out the other. Ooh. And I grabbed my sweatpants and I pulled the choya balls off, but I rolled the pant leg up, and these needles were stuck all the way through my leg. And I was trying to pull them out, but I couldn't get them out. So I was like, okay, I just need to get to the light so I can see what I'm doing. Sounds like a nasty plant. Now wait, I um, I walked over to the light to the jousting field where there was a bunch of light around. And I rolled up my pant leg, and there wasn't even a red dot to show that there was anything there. Like, there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I looked up into the sky, and I could see all of these stars that looked a lot brighter than they would have normally. And then I saw out in front of these stars, they would move out from in front of the stars and move back to show me that they were there. They were all around me in a circle, like lots of them, mm -hmm. probably 13 of them. And um, <laughs> at that point, I called my mom, and I told her what happened. And I told her that they had just abducted me or something. They did something to me. And I told her that all these things were around and looked, just looked to see that they were there. And she went out there, and she looked, and she, didn't see, she said she didn't see anything. And I was like, all right, well... I'm going to go back. So, you know, you know, now, that's... when I went back to this group of my friends that were still sitting there waiting for me to come back, it seemed to me like I was only gone for about an hour. They told me I had been gone for five hours. Wow. And so then I went immediately back to this lady that had just told me all this stuff, and I had explained to her what had just happened. And she turned to me and she said, thank you for all the good work. And I rolled up my, in my pant leg to show her my ankle. And where, there, where there, nothing was there anymore, where those Troy needles were, there was a small, small, really small little, like, millimeter by millimeter, trying to do this, like, little square protruding out of my skin. It was like underneath my skin. And she reached out and she touched it and I felt it integrate into my whole entire nervous system. It was the weirdest feeling I could have ever explained. But she just activated the chip yeah. that they planted. And then, mm -hmm. yeah. We talked for a little while after that and then I could never get a hold of her again. But you know, that, that's, that's like crazy that you've had that experience. Like I haven't had an experience like that yet, but you know Justin Varengia believes in all that stuff, right? From the Empower Network? Oh really? Yeah, he's my sponsor. He he has a UFO website on YouTube. Oh, I'm totally into UFOs. Yeah. So that's there's no coincidence that you that you had that experience and that like he's in the Empower Network cuz once we go to that event and sh Colorado, is it in Colorado? Yeah. I don't know if you're going, but we can go and we can talk to with him because he's had experiences in Costa Rica. He was telling me when I had a um, what is it like a coaching session, and he just like I don't like talking about stuff like too too often about that stuff. Anyways, my boyfriend's stepdad he flew airplanes, like he was in the air whatever Air Force and. He won't deny that that stuff isn't real, but he doesn't want to talk about it because he's paranoid. No, like, I have I, no problem. Like, talk I'm about talking about, like, the government. He's scared talking about it. 
Because he's scared the government's going to come after him if he talks about it and says it's real. Yeah, and there's so many people talking about it. The government doesn't have enough I'm employees. talking about, like, yeah. he, was in, he was in the military, and he won't even discuss it because he's like, whatever the military has told him, he's like, I'm not talking about this. Yeah, they but actually I'm not going to say that it's real or not. But they, they do scare people away from talking about what they know. Mm -hmm. so they know. They totally know. They've like already... Area 51 stuff, like when, when I went to Nevada and we went wherever Area 51 is, we went to Vegas and we went towards in, that area. It's in New Mexico. It's in yeah. New Mexico, Roswell, New Mexico. But, I mean, he, he mentioned it and he said, he, he was like, yeah, that stuff's real. I'm not even going to talk about it. Yeah, I went to the Alien Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. They have a little piece of the spacecraft there. And they had it, they, they put it under a microscope and they blew up the picture of it. And it looks like circuitry. Like people, the, oh yeah, yeah. The whole ship was a integrated people circuit. Think that, you know, yeah. aliens are bad, and Justin doesn't think they're bad. He thinks they're no. just they're just different energy, and like people are making them to look bad, but they're, they're waiting, not. They're, they're waiting not. for us to become unified before yeah. they you know make contact. But, but you know what? Good and bad have nothing to do with it. It's just like us and and, and the Illuminati. Every there are factions within races that all have these different agendas. So it's like, are humans good or bad? That's a hard one to answer because it can't be answered because every human has free will choice. We're all just going to do what we're going to do. And yep. on that note, I'd like to give a bit of a disclaimer out to anybody who might be watching this or watching this in the future. Um, everything that we said about anything. And we'll continue to say on uh, this particular um, Google Hangout, if you believe us, you're a fool. And if you disbelieve us, you're a fool. Think for yourself. Make up your own fucking mind. The fact that any of us have said anything doesn't mean a goddamn. Do your own research. It's so out if you there. believe us, you're a fool. If you disbelieve us, you're a fool. Have your own experiences. Make up your own mind. Think for yourself. I want to tell you guys. As you said in the beginning, use your own discernment. Yeah, yeah discernment and clarity. You, you use what you can use, what the rest, just shelve it until it either becomes valuable and you can use it, or it, it just becomes dust. Right. And realize that there's no crime in an answer of I don't know. Right. Anybody, Everybody's learning. I have to think that we have to know. It either is or it isn't. We have to know. I don't know is a valid answer. Any of anyone watching this, watching us and thinking, well, I don't know about these guys. I, I really, I really don't know. I'm not sure. Awesome. You're off to a perfect start. You've just admitted you don't know. That is the first starting point of learning. Because if you don't admit that you don't know, you can't learn anything. Because if you think you already know, then you're blocking knowledge. You guys want to know something that happened that I want that I haven't really shared with too many people. Um, well, you're about to share it with the world. I know. I, I love this. We're all going. We're all going to Chicago. That are in the Empower Network, or not Chicago? Sorry, get them confused. Colorado, and uh, the Stanley Hotels in Colorado. And I went there, and it's one of the most haunted hotels. And I've actually been there, and they have these ghost tours where they have you go on these tours, and they tell you about the hotel. And I had this camera. There's probably 15 people standing behind me on the fourth floor, and this tour guide was having these kids that were on the tour stand telling everybody, and like, I think they were singing Ring Around the Rosies or something like that, because I guess the story goes that the kids that are on the fourth floor haunt the fourth floor, so we're on there, I'm, I'm taking pictures, and this guy, like, he's telling this story about how this guy, Mr. Stanley, goes and he haunts this hotel and, like, hides in the closet and tries to scare people, and I'm just sitting there thinking that this this guy's just trying to scare everybody because we're on the tour, and I'm taking pictures, and I take the first picture, and this girl's arm's down that's standing in the middle, and then the second picture, her arm goes up like this, and then the third picture, I actually have all these pictures on my Facebook, you can actually see this black shadow dude that's really like, like you can see a window and all the pictures below like are before, mm -hmm. and this shadow guy, he's standing in the middle, and these kids kids there's six kids on the side of him and there's people standing behind me in the group and they're I'm like I'm looking at my camera and like you see the frame you know when your camera takes a picture and you can see it for a second and then it goes away 
Mm-hmm. And knew I caught something. I'm sitting there looking, and I'm like, and I, I'm I'm pushing play, and I'm looking, and I'm like, well, I'm looking at the first picture and the second picture and the third picture, and I'm I'm really confused. And the tour guide, he's like, "What'd you catch?" And I show him, and he's like, "Holy crap, what'd you get?" <clears throat> and I, and I'm I'm showing people, and like I said, there's people standing behind me on the ghost tour that like witnessed that I did not like fix this picture to have this guy standing because there's people behind me and. Um, it's like one of the craziest things I've ever caught, paranormal-wise, because I actually have things to back it up. And the whole the whole hotel being haunted. I can't wait till we go to Colorado because I actually want to take people that are in the Empower Network to go to that hotel because that hotel has so much energy. It's insane. Like it's built on granite, which is supposed to like have a whole bunch of energy that's supposed to trap energy or something like that and not trap. It's, gotta go. it's it's supposed to like it's a powerful rock it's a fort- it's a fort- yeah yeah and like when you go there on the fourth floor like i was standing there walking or running up and down the hallway and you're standing there and you're looking and there's nobody there and this is like the middle of the day. It's not during the night, like where everybody thinks ghosts <clears throat> are awake during the middle of the night, but this is during the normal time, mm-hmm. during the day. And I caught a lot of pictures. And you know that the Stanley Hotel is like where The Shining, the movie was wrote. You know what that movie is? Like, I've the heard Shining? of it. I'm not yeah. sure if I've seen it. It's a scary movie. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a really popular movie, but Stephen King stayed in that hotel with his wife, and uh, I can't remember the room number, I think it might be 207, I'm not sure, but um, the story goes is like the, the maid, she lived in that room, and if she doesn't like you, she'll throw your stuff out of the room, and if she likes you, she'll put your stuff in like the closet nicely, and Stephen King's wife, like he went upstairs to the room after he was drinking in the bar, and she was like, oh thanks for putting my stuff away, and he's, he's standing there, and he's like, I didn't put your stuff away, and there's nobody else in the hotel, cause it's a it's in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. It's like nobody stays in that hotel during that time. So, like little things like that. I can't wait till we go to Colorado. It's gonna be so much fun, especially if you believe in the paranormal stuff. That's like the place to go. I've got some stories for you. Um, when I was at the Renaissance Festival as the caretaker. Because mm-hmm. they would all take off. They would only be here for two months, and then I would have the whole place to myself. And the first year, you know, they just kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, put me out there, like, here you go. So I'm going around the place, and I, um, like, I would see people. And they'd be walking around, and then I'd go and try to find them, and then they'd just be gone. And um, and then there was, like, I would go be doing my rounds, there was this one spot where I'd go around and then I and I turned around. When I turned around to go back the other direction, I saw the desert scene all of a sudden turn into like a park scene, all perfectly primped and manicured with nice green lawns and a concrete path. And there was a guy pushing a baby carriage really, really fast. And then when I snapped back to look at it again, it was all gone. Well, I realized later that all of a sudden I had some dogs and then a big litter of puppies and I was really busy running around everywhere and all of a sudden it was like a message to me of what was going to happen in the future. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I started talking to some of the ladies in the office about it because there was ladies that would still work in the office all year. And she said, it's funny that you mentioned that because there used to be a caretaker here that um, that's what my job was. And they said that he, they came back one year and they found him surrounded by beer cans dead. Like he drank himself to death in the middle of the desert. He just went stir crazy. And um, then there was a, a group, a family that had come to the festival and they had gotten their picture taken near the front gate. But when they got the picture developed, there was another guy standing there with their family in the picture. And they're like, that guy wasn't there when we took this picture. They have the picture that's got the guy in it, and that was a friend of the site crew manager, and he knew who that guy was. His name was Greg. Well, then after that, I started seeing other people. Like, I went into the feast hall that they were building, 
to drop off some supplies that I had picked up from Home Depot for him. And as I went in there to drop him off, and I went to turn around to leave, I saw a guy walking in, like in blue jeans and a um, like a, a flannel shirt and suspenders. And um, and then I turned back to look again, and he was gone. <laughs> And then I hear that they had found a guy half eaten by coyotes on the wall on the near the highway by the fence line. One of the booth owners had died in a heart attack in his trailer behind the booth. I mean there was all kinds of people that had died out there. There was one guy that even committed suicide in one of his trailers and my friend actually owned that trailer that he committed suicide in. So Do you actually think that you might have like some type of ability if you're able to like sense all these things cuz yeah, I'm clairvoyant. Yeah, because I have a ability where I didn't really come to terms with it until after the event in Chicago. But, like, I went I went into this, um, what is it, a casino? And, like, this is after I met everybody. They're like, are you psychic or something? I'm sitting there, I'm like, no, I'm just, like, I can feel what other people are feeling. I can feel if they're pissed off or I can feel if they're being negative or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, Ashley, you want to know a secret? Yeah. Everyone has that ability. There's only yeah. two types of people in the world: people who know it and people who don't. Yeah. yeah. So, but I, but I, I can tap into it pretty easily because um, I just can because that event just made my experiences grow because I've been in this paranormal group for such a long time. So I go into this casino and I can literally hear the people being all pissed off at the machines and like I'm not winning and like that's all I could feel and like I could feel a little bit of the good stuff. But I got to the point where I had to tell my friend Kevin, I was like, I don't want to be in this place. Like, I don't like getting here. It's not really my thing. And then he kept on, he kept gambling. He gambled over $500. And I kept telling him, I was like, let's go. This isn't the, this isn't the place to be right now. And he kept on saying, no, 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 every time he put the money in the machine. And then he wouldn't win. And I just sat there and I was like, I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to tell him he's not going to win because he's not listening. He's not He's not in tune with everything. He just wants to waste his money. So I just was like, let him waste his money. And then I left. But, like, I've been able to tap into that stuff for quite some time. And, like, an experience that I had that still blows my mind is I went to this cemetery with my group. And this little girl, like, she came up and she, I know it was a little girl. Because she came up and she, like, she has this way of, like, going like this and, like, touching your arm, like, with her finger or something. And I just know it's a little girl. I don't know how else to explain it. But, like, that happened to me one time. And I went out and I got some Tootsie Rolls. Because I found her gravestone. I think I think it was, like, 1905, 1910. Like, she died pretty young. And I go there. I bring some Tootsie Rolls. Leave, leave them out in, like, this area that's... I don't know what it was. It was like a building that was just empty. And I think it might have been a cremation building. I'm not 100% sure. But we put the Tootsie Rolls out, and we're walking around, and then I, I'm with my team leader, Mike, and then, like, I see this guy walk walk across in a hoodie, in a white hoodie, and I have my walkie-talkie, and I'm like, Victor, was that you? And he's like, no, I'm over here. So I run over to him, and then I realize he's in a black hoodie, and I was like, I think I just saw a ghost. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a full-figured person, and, like, this place has fences everywhere, so it's like no one could just come in there. Hey, no. Ashley, you want to know something? Yeah. Even one misconception when people tend to have, like, let's say someone appears to be haunting a place, and let's say it's, you know, 100 plus years beyond their death, right? So we think, all right, they must have been haunting it for 100 plus years. Not really. Space time doesn't work like most people think it does. Mm -hmm. And. And people on that side of the veil, I mean, time is just a, another geography. It's just another doorway. We're so from their, from, their perception, from their perception, they might have died two hours ago and have been interacting with people over the span of a century or two in our time, but from their subjective perception of time, they died two hours ago. It's you got to understand, they're... time is not the solid, fixed position. It's I their have to finish energy. Telling you what I was telling you though before, like I left the anyways, I left the tootsie rolls out, and then after I saw that guy, I I went back, found him, and then found Mike, went over with Mike, and Mike was like, "Let's go check on 
our, the area where we left the candy. Came back and we we left five pieces of candy out. Two of the pieces of candy were gone, and I had an EVP recorder going, which is an electric voice phenomenon. Oh yeah. Walked up, the candy was gone, and I'm kind of in shock, standing there like my reaction was, I kind of laughed because I couldn't believe that it was gone, and then on an EVP when I went to go listen to it after this event happened, you hear me saying, oh my god, where's the candy? And then you hear on the EVP, took the candy. Seriously. Swear to god. Like, um, <laughs> when you actually hear something like that, you're like, you're, you're like, holy crap, this little girl's like communicating with me, and like, she actually took something that I gave to her, and um, and, like another story that goes along with that is like we went back. That she couldn't eat it. It was gone. I don't know if she ate it. She just said took candy. Yeah, but there, just because she took it doesn't mean she could eat it. She's beyond the veils. You're working with multi dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, but she could have pulled it over to the other dimension. See, I'm not sure, but what ha what another thing that happened is a cop came. I think it was like our fourth visit to the cemetery, and he was standing in like the driveway area where you pull in. And he was standing talking to me, and the little girl did the same touch thing, like with her, with her arm like this. And all of a sudden, the cop's standing there, and his face just gets white. And like I told you, that I could sense things. So I'm like, I'm like, that she just did the same thing she did to me, to you. And he's standing there, and he's like, what? And I went up and I showed him, and I like did the same swipe on his arm. And the cop looked at me, and he was like, okay, have fun. And he like got in the car and like drove off. Like he didn't want to have anything to do with that place. <laughs> it was hilarious, though. Like, uh, I now, seriously. <laughs> you want to hear something really cool? Huh. Um, when when I was dealing with all kinds of issues with my dad um, and my family, because they're all Mormon, right? Oh yeah. And, Did you know that and, um, David's the owner of the Empower Network is Mormon? Oh really? Like yeah. still still part still Mormon? No. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, Anyways, I, I actually figured out how how souls are used in religion. Like basically when people devote themselves so so strongly to a belief like that, <clears throat> when they die they still are tied to that belief. And so when people go into a church, all that energy that they feel that they call the spirit is actually a bunch of spirits all calling out to them and trying to pull them into that place. And what they're doing is they're actually taxing more than just the people's money. They're taxing their spiritual energy. David Ike talks a lot about this. They're actually pulling a lot of spiritual energy off of people to use it for their own interests and purposes, unbeknownst to the good-hearted people that are trying to follow those religions. It's just like how our government takes our tax dollars and goes and uses it to fund warfare. It's the same thing. So yeah, David Icke goes into that, among other people. I just came up with this on my own. I figured it out by what they told me. I was well, other pe other people have figured it out too, which should just yeah. it should just prove to you that you're on the right track because. The more people who figure things out on their own that don't know each other, have never met each other, but they're all telling the same story, that's a little process of vetting and quantification. Now, I've actually, a bunch of times, while I was sitting there in church, <clears throat> listening to these constant droning talks, because they all talk in like this monotone voice, right? And I would sit there and I would actually be taken into a trance of some sort, where I would... Astro, I would leave my body, and then I would all of a sudden be walking through the halls around the church, and I would like see people about to walk through a door, and then all of a sudden I would jerk back into my body, like really jerk, and then I would see that person finally go through the door on the other side. It's really weird stuff. Yeah. But, I've never uh, really been a big fan of church, not because I don't believe in stuff, it's just, I don't like getting stuff shoved down my throat, like, oh, you have to believe in this, or you're gonna go to hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know well, what? It, it's all part of the slavery concept. Actually, what? I'm a Christian, I found God after leaving the church. Yeah, me too. 
I found the best people do, are yeah. the non-denominational Christian churches that accept people for who they are. I consider myself an agnostic Christian. That was closer to what Jesus was. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't like how most churches are like, here, give me money. We need money. We need money. It's like... Modern day Pharisees, I call them. Jesus warned us about them. Yeah, exactly. The scribes and the Pharisees, the lawyers and the judges. <laughs> it's, it's just like people need money, but they don't, like a church shouldn't be sitting there asking people for it. Like, No. And actually, if you listen to the words that Jesus said, he said that, look, you people in these churches, you're all fine. You have everything you need. What you need to be doing is you need to be reaching out to these people in the streets that are starving yeah. and naked and poor. Those actually, are the people the problem that need help. Actually, the problem is the churches don't ask. They guilt trip. If yeah. they do, that would be a whole other thing. Yeah. I mean, I can ask you something and you give me an answer, but I'm not hounding you. I'm not like, come on, see it my way, see it my way. Come on, bitch, bitch, my way. Come on, come on, come on. But that's what the churches do. If you say no thanks, they go, oh, well, wait a minute. If you say no thanks, baby Jesus is going to get pissed off and kick your ass. Well, I mean, it's not only that. It's like, look at the Catholic Church. Like, my boyfriend has this whole aspect of he can't stand in the Catholic Church because look at how many people are in the Catholic Church that are, like, molesting children, like, pastors that are molesting children, like, that's well, coming out of a church? Like, that I can, stuff just is, like... I can tell you this right now. There are a lot of people like that that are not Catholics. They join the religion in order to smear it. <laughs> exactly. But just like, just like um, all these terrorist Muslims mm -hmm. out there, they're not Muslims. They don't practice Islam. They just were terrorists that went in there to destroy... And smear the belief structure. Yeah, just like that, the, whole thing, that whole aspect just bugs me. And like, he, he doesn't have anything to do with religion because he's like, well, why does the Bible say that you can, that if Jesus died on the cross, that, that he'll forgive you for everything you've ever done wrong? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I have no answer for you. I don't have an answer for you. Hey, Ashley, you know how you could end poverty in a week or less? Sell off all the assets of the Vatican. Yeah, oh, yeah, right? How about we just campaign for all those votes? Yeah. By creating the right social structure that everyone's going to just jump in on and start sending all their money to once they see it's actually working. Yeah, money votes, not brainwash, go to the polls votes. People yeah. don't realize that their power is in their choices, not Every in the ballot dollar. they punch a hole into. Every dollar is a vote for the kind of world that you want to live in. Well, and we're supposed to have all this freedom, but how do we have freedom when they make everything that we that we want to do illegal? Like, for example, by turning smoking, our backs on like, them and not listening to them anymore, because really their words have absolutely no meaning until we start following them. I we mean, are the ones who give their words meaning. Like the whole thing with the gay rights. Like, why can't we get married if we're gay or anything? Like that kind of thing makes me mad. Like I think. It's almost as bad as saying, like, if you're black, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, if you're gay, you can't get married. That's, I got another that's the same question. thing. Why is the government even regulating that? That's none of their fucking business. No separation of everything. church and state. It should you know, be. Yeah, you know what? If I, if I like a girl, I don't, need to, I don't need to prove it to the government, and I don't need to get a license to like her. I know, and why, and, but this is why, what I'm at. Is it's supposed to be legal. Now it's legal to marry, but you can't get a divorce if you're an, a lesbian or a gay or transgender. Like, that is the stupidest law I've ever heard of. You know what? Let's look at it this way, right? <laughs> in, in the hunter-gatherer societies that we, like, that, that, that we originally came from, they didn't believe in marriage. They just would have many partners. And at that point, the women knew who their children were. But the men had no idea who their children were. So all of the children looked to all of the fathers as, as father. And all of the fathers looked to all the children as son. And if any of the <coughs> men were to do anything to hurt any of the children or any of the women, the women would band together and hunt down and kill that man. <laughs> and so at that point, really, you know... People just really got along better. They worked better together. 
And, you know, drugs were not something that were condemned. They were something that was celebrated as part of their culture. Yeah, and it's, like, number one, like, an herb being banned from, like, the United States, like, you know what's sad is you can get a hold of, of, of green, as people call it, easier than you can get a hold of, like, a Vicodin. Yeah, in well, this country. see, what our government did was they made all this stuff illegal so they could turn around and sell it to us on the black market and pull in a bunch of money to fund these wars and terrorism. Yeah, because the CIA is Cocaine Import Agency, among other things. Yeah. If it's, if it's legal, it's not worth as much. Well, if it it's also... Illegal, it's worth a lot more. It also fed into the, cor the, the privately owned prison system. And so what they're doing is they're making it to where they can just take whoever they want and then put them into a jail cell and force slave labor on them. I mean, really, it, they're making maybe a dollar an hour for what they make. It's slavery. Yeah, it's really sad. You know, my brother just got busted for selling stuff, and now he has, an, he has a drug addiction because he was on pain medication, and then he, he lost his pain medication, and it's easier for him to get a hold of this illegal stuff than it is his pain medication. Well, not only that, but... And it's like... You know, all I want to take this opportunity in this particular topic to try to test out the YouTube plug-in because there's this perfect little video called Why Marijuana is Illegal. Can I finish one point real quick? Sure. Um, all of these sayings about how um, weed and meth and stuff make you paranoid right well it's really the fact of the stigmas that people put towards it and the way that oh, oh it's working okay so it's oh, I'm... all right so it's it's pretty much Someone keeps pausing it. Its own. This thing is having a mind of its own. I did that by accident. <laughs> Were you all?
<laughs> I thought you might like that. Oh man, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you know, I picked this up from the Fresh and Easy, right? This is um, Nature's Path Hemp Plus Granola. And you know, it's funny. Lately, I've been here. Let me put you in the main video window so that um, people watching can have a clearer view. It's all backwards, anyways. That's okay. We'll still get the idea. And besides, um, when we watch the video, we'll read it forwards. It's only backwards to you. Oh, okay. So go ahead and display whatever you want to show. We'll show and tell. So this right here. Lost Ashley again. This is nature's path. Nature's path. Hemp plus granola. You can get this from the fresh and easy. And it's hilarious that the fresh and easy is actually a Tesco company. And they're based out of Britain. And um, they popped over in these uh, fresh and easy stores all over the place here in the United States a few years ago. And now they've got all these commercials going around everywhere saying, It's about time. Life's this F and easy. Now that we got fresh and easy. <laughs> oh man, those commercials crack me up. You go up to the front door and they even say like, now it's like F and easy, right? They put their little brand name Lego lo logo right over the R E S H on Fresh, so that it just says F and easy. <laughs> Reminds me of that new Kmart Kmart commercial. I just shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one yet, but man, that's hilarious. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh uh. I got oh, it. Oh, it's um. It's about um, when you something like when you order online, you get free shipping, or something like that. So they're saying, "I just ship ship my pants, ship my drawers," <laughs> and um, and they say it so fast that they say "ship" instead of "I just shipped." They say, "I just ship my pants," but they say it better. Like, I just ship my pants. I just ship my pants. So you know what it sounds like they're saying. Yeah, man. It's almost like it's too perfect. Like everything was just set up that way in the first place, right? <laughs> was our language programmed in order for us to be able to make these plays on it? <laughs> well, I don't know. Can you take response ability or can you have a coincidence instead of a coincidence? Yeah, exactly. Are there people who are stupid, ignorant, or are they just choosing to uh, willfully ignore the evidence right in front of them? Well, uh, we lost Jay, and we lost Ashley. I don't know if uh, they left of their own free will or if they got booted and they're going to come back. Oh, we'll probably find out pretty soon. Uh, looks like there's something here that is trying to open. What was this? Firefox is trying to open something? I don't know. For some reason or another, we programmed this operating system onto um, this Linux installed it on here um, the, the Firefox web browser but for some reason or another it got changed over to some foreign language and I still haven't figured out how to change it back to English <laughs> so there's all these like all the stuff that I want to do on here I can't figure out because it's all in some foreign language and I'm like I want to know how to switch it back and I've tried to find all kinds of different forums or whatever so people that can tell me how to do it and they just tell you, oh, yeah, go to this and go to that. And it's like, yeah, but I would if I knew what this was saying. I think, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, think I should um, call Ashley and see whether or not she left via glitch or left via choice. Oh, yeah, that might help. Okay, Jay, Jay left on purpose. He's texting me. Oh, okay. So give me a second. Let me call...
fine. Hey, I'm, was I'm on my way getting back on. Like, for some reason, my computer, like, kicked me out. Okay. Yeah, because Jay left, too, but he left voluntarily. We weren't sure if he left voluntarily or via computer. Uh -huh. Just give me a minute. I, I think it's just the reset my computer again. Sometimes it does that. All right. This is going to be a, a long-ass um, Google Hangout session, probably the the longest I've ever participated in ever. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I was just thinking, man, it's oh, like... I on the pretty awesome. Wait, it's, it's 1 11 in the morning. <laughs> uh, 3 mm -hmm. 11 here. Hmm. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's what my computer says it is. Jay said, yes, it's getting late. Five hours worth should be uh, good for a start. And I said, no shit, lol. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, think we, I think we covered quite a few basics here. But that yeah, is, we did. It is still just the basics. I mean, really when it comes down to it, there's so much information out there that there's no way for any one person to encapsulate all of it. So, yeah, let me make something else clear to our viewers, though, for those who have actually lasted this fucking long, um, who haven't tuned out before now. Um, we're not saying to hop on board Safety Net Industries or hop on board this or hop on board that. We're not saying hop a bandwagon. What we're saying is look around and see what you can do in your own life and coordinate with others who are who are doing the same this isn't force of will to join a group this isn't group think that's that's not that's not what we're after remember the title of this is discernment and clarity do what you can do in your own life talk with others who are doing the same and let that spread like the like the lit match creating the forest fire let that be a meme of just a new way of thinking you don't have to join a group to make change. You don't have to join a nonprofit organization to make change. Now, if you want to join something cool, but you don't have to. Just making the change in your own life. The more people who make that change in their own lives, you start to change the reality around you. If you want to change the fish in the ocean, the 